Okay. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, uh, everybody. Depending on what is your time zone, this today is the uh, second and last day of our plenary talks. Uh, we have Patrick here. He will go over uh, the, the schedule for today, and I'll, I'll kick it off with Lunis, our our first guest. Patrick, to you. Cool. Yeah. So thanks everybody for attending another day of SciCon. It looks like uh, before we announce the schedule, two quick questions uh, here from the audience. Um, Simon mentioned that uh, the NIH is one of the main sources of funding for academic institutions. Uh, do we have any idea of what their thoughts are around decentralized publishing and open access? Um, if the NIH supported Research Hub, then it would help a lot more scientists to use us. And yeah, I totally agree. I think that's kind of like the end stage goal for Research Hub is to be able to help to service like the public funding of science. Um, Typically, like uh, traditional academics are skeptical of blockchain and token economies, but I'm pretty sure the NIH held a workshop maybe two years ago uh, where a bunch of people got together and talked about the concept for something called Litcoin is how they phrased it. And it was essentially like a uh, token incentive to encourage academics um, to publish like their data sets in real time and also to publish in open access repositories. So I think it'll take a while for the NIH to be like totally on board with crypto, but I think they're starting to think about it. So uh, I can definitely see a world like five, 10 years in the future where the NIH is like actually interested in using some of these uh, Web3 tools to help to support more research. Um, yeah, and then one other question is, uh, what is research coin and where is it der or value derived? And so right now, Research Coin has actually three pretty interesting uh, value propositions or utility statements. The first is participation in uh, the Research Hub community. Just organized a number of snapshot votes um, where Research Coin holders are able to help to direct uh, the social side of the project. Um, in addition, we have like a tipping mechanism on the website. So you can support the comments and the papers that you find most exciting on Research Hub. And just uh, last week, we shipped a bounty feature. So um, you can add research coin bounties to specific questions in order to have people in the Research Hub community come in and answer them. And then later this week, we'll also ship bounties for uh, peer review and a couple of other things that we're thinking about. So yeah, I guess the utility uh, statement for research coin right now is those three. And we'll continue to kind of like add more utility in the future as we iterate on our product. Um, yeah, so thanks for those questions. And then looking at the schedule today, uh, the first talk that we have is from uh, Lanis, who's one of the founders of DWORK, um, basically like a decentralized platform for token bounties entitled How Decentralized Project Management Tools Help to Facilitate Community Success for DeSci DAOs. After that, we have uh, Eugene Leventhal um, talking about decentralized research centers. Then Shadi uh, Eldamadi uh, speaking about primitives for aut autonomous DSI protocols, followed by Eric Van Winkle uh, with a talk entitled Converting Intellectual Capital to Social Capital, Rebuilding Communication Pathways Between Scientists and the General Public. Uh, followed by that, we have Web3 or Web3 Women in Science uh, for a panel on onboarding scientists to DSI Web3 organizations. Um, Adam Draper will follow that up with a talk on the failure of VC in science. Uh, after Adam is Christopher Hill, uh, the founder of DSI Labs, who will speak about open verifiability towards a more reproductive scientific record, which returns value to scientific communities. Um, following Chris, uh, we have a research hub community member uh, by the name of Cole, who will speak about expanding your impact utilizing video as a medium for scientific communication. Um, and yeah, so that's all the talks we have for today. Thank you, Ricardo. Okay, uh, thank you, Patrick. I'll take it from here and I will introduce uh, Lonis, our first guest. So Lonis is the co-founder of DWORK, a Web3 native uh, project management platform that just recently raised 5 million in a seed funding round that was co-led by crypto investing giant Paradigm and early stage venture capital firm Pace Capital. Before founding DWORK, Lonis was also Previously founded Depict AI, a Y Combinator backed startup providing Amazon quality product recommendations for any e commerce store. Lonis has been a DAO contributor for the past couple of years, and at the end of 2021, he launched DWORK, that is a powerful solution for DAOs enabling token payments, credentialing, and bounties, which tasks for the community to complete. 
We've been using DWORG, personally, a research job for the past four months, and I have to say it really changed the way we organize tasks, and it really you know, helped getting our community more involved. So without further ado, uh, I will leave the floor to Lonis. Uh, thank you, Lonis, for being here today. Uh, how are you doing? Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm doing all, all good. I'm here in Paris, so I'm a bit, uh, I might be a bit out of, out of shape, but otherwise it's all good. Yeah, you're good. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's really good to be here. I Way back when, when I still was in college, I, I wanted to become like an economist. Um, but then I read up more and more about the kind of replication crisis, which kind of made me very un, uh, un, 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 unexcited about that. So I kind of dropped out and started uh, companies instead. So, but yeah, I'm really excited to be here to kind of also hear about how you guys are solving the kind of replication crisis and, and more. That's crazy. You, you've been, uh, the, I think, the, the third or the fourth person in two days <laughs> talking about a reproducibility crisis. Like, this is also what brought me into, uh, into research shop. So that's really cool. Again, really excited to see your workshop. Awesome. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so um, as you mentioned, the, the work is kind of the largest task and bounty platform uh, for DAOs. So we raised recently from Paradigm and a few, few others. Um, and I thought I would just go through a bit, a uh, few of the boards that have been set up by these side DAOs to kind of give you a sense of how, how it can be uh, used today. Um, and then also kind of uh, have some um, show a bit about how it could, could be used, but it's not currently used. Um, and then also, uh, we're super happy to have any questions or comments or uh, or thoughts at the end. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, basically we have a, a bunch of, of things on the work. We have uh, about 20,000 created tasks and bounties in total in the last six months, as, um, and uh, more than 11,000 signed up contributors. And so here on the landing page, you can kind of see a bunch of them. Um, and if we look for research, we, of course, find that here as well. Um, and just to give you a sense of it, this kind of the DAO, DAO level homepage, um, and they have kind of structured um, structured work in, in different kind of areas. Um, and you can kind of see a leader, leaderboard function if you want to see kind of who who is who has been working on what, um, which can be very useful for kind of learning about the DAO. Um, and you can also kind of just see on this combined board all the things that are are be, have been working. Uh, are, are worked on. Um, so um, here's, for instance, an, one type of bounty where you can share an in-depth deep peer review um, and you can kind of uh, uh, apply to, to, to kind of uh, claim this task where you like, upload, upload uh, or find, find this paper um, and yeah, peer review it. Um, uh, which, and I really love this, like personally, because most of the peer reviews usually are like un completely anonymous. And it's not like easily accessible in the context of when you're reading a paper. Um, so we definitely need more peer review. And the way you would use, do in here in DWORK is you can just apply and say, I want to do this thing. I, I'll have it done by, by the weekend. Um, and I can say, I previously uh, looked at sim similar uh, research um, or whatever. And then, yeah, in this case, there's, there's already a bounty of 10,000 research hub uh, coins. Um, you can also say that you you think you, you'll do this for twelve thousand. That's it. So you can kind of bargain if you wish to, um, or if there's not a bounty already. Uh, so this kind of create a more efficient market, a more two-sided market. So it's not only the supply side setting prices, but um, you can kind of uh, both sides can set the prices. So I can just apply to this, um, and then, so that's one kind of bounty. You can also run um, and then if if I'm uh, uh, lucky enough, they will accept me, and then I can do this uh, bounty and get paid at the end. And there's also other kinds of uh, bounty types on the work. So you can run contests where basically anyone can just come and, and submit the peer review and get paid uh, without any application and get paid based on the quality. Um, so that's another one. And the third one, which I think is very unique to the work actually, um, being completely biased, but, but, but still, is that you can gate bounties by uh, by roles so um, you, what you basically can do is you can um, create a task like share Fitbit data with us like a data collection bounty or whatever um, and you can uh, basically gate permissions to it so you can you can run contests you can have applications and you can also have it gated by discord roles 
Um, so what it basically enables you to do is you can have a kind of research, um, you can have roles for kind of how much you trust a particular person in, in your community and allow those people to, um, uh, let's see here, to, to, to claim roles based on their, um, hmm, all right, okay, I should say this, this goes over, they didn't have any roles, here we go. So you can imagine having like a researcher level two role or a um, dev level three role. Uh, and then you can, if you have those kind of roles, then you could, will be able to just claim bounties without asking. Um, so here it will work. I'll just connect to your server, your current server. Um, add that. Um, and then you can say, if you're a dev level three or you're a community level or you're a porting person, then we trust you that much. So you, you, you don't need to apply. You can just claim this bounty directly. Um, so just to show that. Uh, uh, here, yeah. uh, level three, core team uh, here. Uh, yeah, so now you kind of have this, and then let's say that you, when you have this, um, someone in your community wants to kind of make this thing like uh, upload their, their data or um, whatever the task might be. So here we kind of uh, open this, this space as a contributor, and here I can uh, see that this task is, is gated by core team and dev level three. So I can apply, but I, since I don't, don't have these roles myself, I can still only apply. Um, but let's add uh, a new role, which is the dev level one role, which the person does have. So now when I add it, um, when I now refresh from this contributor uh, view, you'll see that I won't need to uh, apply. I can just claim it. So I'm no longer say, need to say I'm interested in apply to it. I can just claim it. And now I'm the kind of owner of the task. And that's really, that can be really beneficial to kind of allow for bottom-ups kind of work structures in, in this kind of, uh, in research styles, for instance, where you don't want to kind of create an overhead of having people apply for, for things, apply for a bounty or run contests where there will be double work. Um, but rather kind of have, have very specific roles um that maybe even once you currently have your server or you might expand those and then you'll be able to, to use those effectively to kind of have these bottom up structures um i have a few things more to show but i just want to pause here to see if there are any kind of questions or comments on that um and then i'll con continue after that yeah i have a question actually Lonis. um so Say, um, you know, maybe somebody completes a task, but they complete it partially, um, mm -hmm. you know, and it's maybe not sufficient to get paid out for the full task. Uh, do you ever uh, come across instances like this? And like, what's the best solution you believe to go you know, give partial payment for what they've done or something like that? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So the way I'm thinking about this, if it's was good done in like good or bad faith, kind of. If it's if it's done in bad faith, it's just like not well done. It wasn't. It wasn't at all according to specifications or whatever. Then I usually just remove them from the task and just put it into do. Um, in the future, we'll we'll have some decentralized way of trusted way of doing this using Claros, for instance. Um, and when we'll have like an ESCO as well that we're working on, um, would, that would be connected to Claros. But yeah, if it's in bad faith, then I then I'm just very I just remove their role if they had a role or if they applied, then I yeah I just remove them from the task. If it's done in good faith, but it's not good, done good enough, or maybe done all the way, but they've really tried, I tend to pay a partial amount um, of that. Yeah, this, so that's one kind of um, uh, one kind of, of bounty structure. Um, yeah, but yeah, let's look a bit more at um, uh, yeah how it, can be, how it can be done. Here we see that, uh, for instance, Research Hub have, um, have completed a bunch of kind of competitions and stuff. Um, so yeah, so, so this can be kind of a really useful way of like creating common knowledge around what is kind of being done in, in the DAO. And one, another, and one of the things we kind of worked on to like help with creating this common knowledge is that we have um, 
uh, we recently shipped roadmaps. So you can uh, say that you can create these projects with like timelines and you can very easily um, yeah, see them in this overview here, which can be, be really useful for like contributors, new contributors, but also potentially um, investors. Uh, so we've, we have a, a bunch of investors we talked with that are, are their associates are using DWORK to kind of get a sense of how different DAOs are doing. Um, um, so this is one way to kind of yeah, do signaling basically. Um, so you can do signaling on the on the DAO level through uh, yeah sorry oh yeah yeah you were only not um, yes yeah, so you can do signaling on the DAO level through roadmaps um, through kind of all the things you kind of com completed as as a DAO um, but then you of course also can do signaling on a uh, on the personal level um, right yeah this is taking a while because we're loading thousands of tasks here, um, uh, but you can also do signaling on a personal level. Um, so for instance, um, this is kind of a profile could look like uh, of a person using the work where they'll be, they'll be able to see all the tasks this person have completed, um, any bounties, um, uh, reviews as well, if applicable, so you can five, five star. Um, and then you also have more, we also have more soft measures of reputation, like the kind of, like the Discord also you have, you're certain a different service you're part of. So here we can see that Wraithers in this case is a, um, is a top level contributor in Kidal. Um, so that's kind of one way to kind of uh, help me build, uh, build trust and kind of, uh, uh, yeah, get, get to know that person more. Um, but yeah, but, um, back to kind of just showing a few more um, DAOs. So we have Research Hub. We also have, uh, uh, yeah, I guess everyone in the listening in kind of are aware of, of, the, of the larger DAOs. So we have lab DAO that are using the work mostly for their uh, for their tech tasks. So they sync with GitHub. Um, and so we have this GitHub sync where we allow you to basically import all the GitHub issues you currently have open and sync them over to your DWork workspace and have them sync one on one. So the uh, titles, descriptions, even the tags are synced to the issue. And if you kind of complete the work task, move it from to do to done or in review to done, then it closes the issue in GitHub. Um, so everything just syncs nicely. Um, um, so yeah, that's that's kind of uh, one way one way to to, to use the work um, uh, doing that. And then I think the, the third. Uh, I searched for them earlier today. Yeah, Cure DAO at least have, have a space. I don't know if they've been removed. Yeah, okay, there we go. So also Cure DAO have a DWORK space. Um, um, and that, uh, yeah, so they're so, so they're really excited about the kind of the complete the entire like PSI. Um, community, um, uh, so we're trying to work with uh, with uh, the community as much as possible. Um, uh, yeah, I have a few more things to show, but I, I think it would maybe be more productive to have it a bit more interactive. So if there are questions, would be happy to kind of delve into that. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Uh, you know, I, I'm really into uh, project management, let's say uh, in real life. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's something that I'm, I'm really uh, interested in. Is a question I have is how do you see uh, how different you see the role of the project manager uh, when you compare that to a web to a kind of like traditional setting? Because I see some differences. Like for example, in organizing this event, I found there was something peculiar about doing an event uh, in like crypto or like web three space. Hmm. Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. It, so the way many kind of uh, scrum managers or, 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 or yes, the way many product managers in web two kind of work is that they. They create the back. They create the backlog, and then you kind of assign different people to different tasks based on their strength and kind of and, and kind of how you, you best resource allocate yourself, uh, which can, can make sense. Uh, um, I don't think that's completely wrong, but that's one approach. What we see a lot of DAOs do is that they instead create these backlogs, these uh, uh, projects and bounties, but then it's kind of bottom, bottoms up who chooses to, to do what. Um, so as a product manager, you can kind of 
gate stuff, so you just not any, and so you just not some people that aren't isn't qualified to claim stuff. Um, but but you can, um, um, but but yeah, you can kind of set set the boundaries through through this through the um, this could be lost, but you you don't really uh, say that you you are you should do this this week this more more of a bottom up structure. Um, that's the way people are using the work list. Yeah, and also I think something uh, maybe you know if you if you know already something that you would like to let's say borrow from the traditional uh, project management uh, aspects, and maybe you want to integrate that into the work. I don't know if you want to share some something about I don't know the roadmap or what you're looking into, for example, and also splitting up costs or like uh, let's say featuring more the the calendar kind of like um, uh, view where you have that similar to a Gantt chart. Where you can picture that in a way that it's you know clear for organizations because i find like the board really uh to be to be useful but something that i use a lot is also you know time-based uh, uh project management tools that will help me really a lot with keeping up with deadlines because it's something that i really find is different compared to a web uh two setting is that in web three you talk you know with people across so many time zones it's difficult sometimes to you know set deadlines and stay within those deadlines it's it's gonna be like a little bit more loose so I don't know if you kind of like are thinking already about enabling that flexibility into your product, considering that, you know, that is probably a little different than, you know, traditional project management uh, projects. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a good good comment. So yeah, yeah, so yeah, the time aspect. So what you can do on, on the work is you can have, uh, for instance, uh, uh, due dates. Um, so in this case, we see that there's a due date of, date of, of, of July. Um, so that's one way to incorporate, and then you can also set like um, our kind of, people have been talking about calendar, like an our implementation of the calendar was the roadmap kind of, but that's on the product level and not on the task level, of course. So it might make sense to kind of um, enable that on the on the task about the level as well. Um, yeah, but, but yeah, I think there are like partly there's a bunch of good stuff you can borrow, borrow from traditional tools, really like linear, for instance. Uh, so we tend to borrow stuff from from there, um, but yeah, where like linear really breaks down is in this like marketplace dynamics and also in the kind of profile building parts. Um, so one of the things we do kind of uniquely is that we um, we actually put your uh, resume on chain. So I I, we, I showed you this kind of profile previously, which is your kind of D work profile, but. But we're, we're actually putting these like individual tasks and their metadata um, on chain. So uh, we're basically minting um, sold bound NFTs. So ERC721 non transferable NFTs with the uh, with the task metadata. So uh, in this case, we and they like conveniently also shows up on your OpenSea um, account. Um, so that's a kind of neat thing where. Uh, even if you don't trust the work, uh, the work will be around in 20 years. Um, um, yeah, all the kind of verifiable, your, your yeah, your kind of work history will, will, will at least, uh, yeah, will continue to, to live on, basically. That is incredibly interesting. I was uh, thinking already about the, the Soulbound tokens when you introduced, like, you know, the panel of, you know, what, it, what is your profile? Because I mm. think, like, if you could get some uh, badges, let's say, after some time that you're a contributor, and you can kind of have milestones that could um in the first place kind of like help uh, for people to gauge their their impact in a, in a community and also help others see uh, other people see you know how active you are and then if you can bring that with you into other communities so with for example a soulbound tokens we had a discussion on research about uh, soulbound tokens i think it was mm. uh yeah with you jeff a couple probably like a couple months ago and they were a really interesting concepts especially for these things you know demonstrating reputation that is something extremely important for DSI as well you know the reputation is something that you know is, is critic for for a lot of academics so um, again, I, I see a lot of potential here on, on, on the work to implement these things and go more toward the direction of sold on tokens and kind of like reputation style um, when you contribute to other DAOs. Yeah, and actually there's yeah. a, um, a question in the Q&A uh, section. So this is from uh, Timothy um, and he's asking, um, could you talk about the business model of D work? Does it charge a percentage from each bounty? Uh, is it denominated in DAOs native <clears throat> tokens? Yeah, yeah, it's a good, good question. Um, so currently, we're not focused on in, in the short term. We're not focused on monetization. 
um, mostly mostly focusing on like yeah building it building a great great product in the kind of medium to long term there are a few ways we're thinking about uh, monetization um, probably at least our work the work in theory is that we sh we won't charge a percentage of each point but rather um, the way it phrased this yeah we're not, we're rather for kind of um, stuff uh, pro features like currently um, it's a kind of one sided marketplace in terms of that you as a contributor you have to go to a bounty and apply to it or claim it um, uh, and you can suggest your own bounty and stuff so there's some some two sidedness to it but you can't you're not uh, but supply side can't invite you um, you have to kind of wait on, on contributors to kind of come to you so we were think about the feature we can invite specific contributors based on their kind of profile and then you might need to pay for inviting contributors to a bounty or to your project so yeah we're also thinking about in, 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 in those kind of ways yeah that's awesome you know similar kind of ideas we're thinking about too in research hub down the road i think top priority is always you know build out you know a good quality high quality product you know to have users enjoy their time there um i had like a a brief question and I think it stems from the fact that um, I think a lot of like our community is kind of a blend of kind of crypto native web three kind of um, literate types of people. And then there's a lot of traditional um, scientific academics who are coming from the traditional world um, and they're using kind of a, a platform that's as very web two familiar. So they're used to it. But then when you sprinkle in kind of the idea of a cryptocurrency or on chain reputation, or any on-chain metrics, even leveraging like a non-custodial wallet. Um, I think these concepts are a little like abstract for them. Um, and I was just wondering if you could uh, maybe touch on um, in DWORK, obviously you can take your non-custodial wallet, you connect that and that becomes your account. And then, you know, you have things moving on chain. Can you maybe just talk about why it's so beneficial to use like a non-custodial wallet um, for something like DWORK as opposed to having say your Gmail link to it and then, you know, have everything through Gmail. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good, um, it's a good question. So one of the really nice things with, um, yeah, not to, yeah, having a thing to kind of your Web3 to, to your, uh, to, to like a non-custodial wallet or, or, or just a web wallet versus Gmail is that interoperability becomes much easier. So for instance, we have this integration with, just to give you an example, um, we have this integration with another kind of large um, DAO tool called uh, Cornip. Um, so Cornip is a way to kind of attractively set bounties, uh, let's say. And um, the way we could in integrate was that um, uh, you we, we basically allow you to in Cornip choose specific DWORK or organizations to connect to. And then we basically pull those DWORK tasks from DWORK to Coordinate and show that on your personal profile. So here in Coordinate, I can see that, okay, you completed these three DWORK tasks in this time, time span. So I know this when I allocate kind of money to you or points to you, which is what Coordinate does. Um, and the way we could kind of connect users between DWORK and Coordinate is through their wallets. Um, so we can just do a simple lookup and say, um, uh, yeah, this kind of 20 address, you have these 20 uh, addresses in your coordinate workspace, and you have these 50 in, in your 50 works, uh, addresses in your DWORK workspace, which ones of those match, and then, okay, then show the DWORK tasks for those that match. Yeah, and I'd say that's the biggest, like, um, kind of way to sell the, the non-custodial wallet in Web3 is that you take, you, you it's like the read, write, own so you are now the owner of a lot of the, the the tasks you've done and the work you've completed and then there's just now all these platforms that are built as a layer on top of that which just um, can pull from some of that information as opposed to having all of your information siloed in this one organization and then it's just stuck there and you have to restart over like you have a twitter and has all your twitter stuff but say there's yeah. a new social media platform you know you can't port over any of that stuff um, sure. And then, yeah, there's another question um, in the Q&A box, which is, um, is Ethereum the only, and this is by Ivan Chung, is Ethereum the only supported network in DWORK? Uh, any plans on expanding beyond that? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. So um, 
so currently we support um, uh, all EVM chains uh, plus uh, Solana uh, and also Stacks wallet on on Bitcoin. Uh, or so, so uh, yeah, so the Stacks blockchain. Uh, sorry, um, uh, through the Hero wallet. Um, um, and yeah, in in the future we might support uh, even more chains. But yeah, we're covering at least uh, most of them currently. Also, I have another question. It's not really a question. It's more like a suggestion, but uh, it's something that just like came up with uh, with this event. Is mm -hmm. something that would be really uh, useful. Maybe it's not like a top priority, but if you could include something like you know, I want to give like a bonus based on a specific task. You know, because mm -hmm. you know, someone performed really, really well. It was like if you could be like a toggle, be like, hey, can give like you know, ten percent, fifteen percent bonus to this person. This is something that I don't know. Maybe you had it already in your mind, but if you don't, maybe it's not something that I don't know. You may consider. Yeah, it's a really good question. So um, that's in the interesting category of something we've launched, but we haven't uh, announced yet. <laughs> um, so uh, on the, in your settings, you can go to permissions and then say manage retroactive bounties. So you can do you can retroactively add extra bounties to kind of tip or like just a reward for extra good work. Um, and uh, so if I add my uh, if I add myself here uh, and then refresh, uh, you can see that you can create this retroactive, retroactive bounties uh, sessions. So you can say, I want to include, include all bounties from two weeks ago until today. Um, yeah, I want, I, I'll pay in ETH uh, and I'll pay, uh, I'll, I'll distribute 100, 100 ETH. Um, and then you kind of, uh, have this session created. Uh, let's see. Why it uh, is probably a bit weird. Uh, all right. It's clearly a bug. Um, but yeah, usually it works. So there are, there are already a bunch of us using it. Um, but yeah, the, the short version is that it basically allows you to, yeah, retroactively set bounties and to to do what what you what you mentioned. Okay, cool. Well, thank you, Lonis. That was that was really great. And again, I can only say that that has helped out a lot in uh, you know in the, in these past couple of months organizing people around. So uh, first of all, thank you very much for for coming here today and you know talking about uh, talking about the work. Yeah, thanks for having me. So uh, next up for SciCon, we have Eugene Leventhal, who's going to be presenting on decentralized research centers. Eugene is the head of operations at the Smart Contract Research Forum, otherwise known as SCURP, which is a grant-funded organization uh, with the mission of increasing, facil er, increasing facilitation between academia and industry around Web3 research. Prior to SCURP, Eugene worked at Carnegie Mellon as a project manager. Um, and he holds a master's in public policy from Carnegie Mellon and also a BS in finance and psychology from NYU. Uh, Eugene, thanks for joining. Hey, Eugene. Pat. Hey, Ricardo. Hey, everyone. How are y'all doing today? Excited to be here. Doing great. Thanks for joining. Yeah, of course. It's been a great run. So happy to be part of, uh, of the first SciCon. Yeah, really exciting to, to be part of it. So hello, everyone. As mentioned, I'm Eugene from the Smart Contract Research Forum, or SCRF as we prefer to call it, uh, SCRF. Um, and I'm going to quickly present on, hopefully it's showing the right screen, uh, which is this presentation on SCURF and Decentralized Research Center. So I'm just going to keep going, assuming it is, unless someone stops me. Um, but yeah, today I'm just going to quickly set some context on SCURF to kind of uh, lay the groundwork of why we're going into and exploring this whole idea of decentralized research centers. Uh, but the bulk of uh, the fifteen, the 10 to 15 minutes that I want to spend speaking on this idea before opening it up to Q&A are really going to be focused on the DRC concept themselves. So SCURF's direct mission is advancing research focusing on the Web3 space. How we're going about this is through the avenue of facilitation. So thinking for people who live mostly in theory versus people who live mostly on the engineering side, how do we create uh, and here we kind of crudely broke it down either as researcher builders or academia industry. And um, it's sort of this crude breakdown, but there's the people who are more uh, kind of focused on the pure theoretical versus the, the applied engineering side. And we're trying to figure out what are all the forms of facilitation in between that can help catalyze and advance an overall research space. 
And so the starting point for us was research discoverability. How do we actually help make research coming out of academia more accessible for those in industry? So we started building our forum. Uh, we have this content type called research summaries where we issue grants to primary authors uh, or to other researchers to summarize research. Uh, so uh, we, we curate a weekly list called Research Pulse of sort of the, re uh, the research that has been hitting Google Scholar in a given week. And from that, we actually do directly reach out to individuals and see if they would like to summarize it. And again, making their research more accessible through these kind of research summaries. Uh, but that's sort of really just the, the starting point for us, where we're actually looking to uh, head from there, right? And if you kind of zoom out and what is this actually, what is the overall question that we're kind of grappling with here? Uh, part of it comes down to uh, knowledge capture and dissemination of Web3 research with a bias for action. Right. So how do we help understand what research is out there and get it to the right people uh, and not just sort of, you know, in their inbox of like, hey, you might want to read this thing. But really thinking uh, what additional forms of facilitation, events, granting, operational infrastructure or what else needs to be in place to support there. So, you know, on the capture side, I already mentioned, we have different grants, we work with different research groups on the dissemination side, you know, we're, we're trying to think through our forum, uh, or we've been building our forum rather, and we're trying to think through what to add in addition to our forum and our actual community. Um, and we're pretty much thinking of it in this way where we have the content that hits the pipeline, how are we, or excuse me, that hits our forum. We have the engagement around it of the community that we're building of various researchers and those who are research curious uh, to be able to actually interact with these ideas. Uh, and then how do we let the world know about all these activities and build more of the kind of strategic partnerships necessary to make sure that all of this uh, information that especially is initially coming uh, heavily from the academic side is getting to the right folks in industry as well. And obviously there's kind of an operational underpinning to all of this, which I'll, I'll touch back on in a moment with the actual concept of DRCs. So what we're effectively doing is a layer across uh, research areas within Web3. We're trying to think of what are the existing networks within governance, within cryptography, within scaling, uh, within oracles, within security, you know, within all the relevant Web3 research domains. How do we identify who's actually doing what and then think of the ways to start connecting across them? So in turn, SCURF is kind of this layer across all of these individual domains. And as we've been thinking about how to enter these individual domains, uh, we, we started coming up with this idea of decentralized research centers uh, and a quick tangent into the idea of networks and specifically impact networks uh, to also help contextualize here. Um, I mean, folks can see here, uh, you know, a definition of networks and the idea of an interconnected group or system. And, you know, these uh, can exist sort of on the biological level, on the social level. There are obviously technological systems, uh, you know, social media uh, and social networks a lot of the time can frequently get thought of in the context of social media as opposed to the fact that we are just social creatures who naturally live in networks and uh, you know the language here is important so I want to reframe networks as these uh, interconnected systems of humans and uh, especially on the biological and social side uh, of the humans as the individual nodes and who's doing what. So I don't know if anyone here has had a chance to read David Ehrlichman's book, uh, Impact Networks, which is a great one. And we actually have a, a YouTube video on our uh, on uh, on YouTube for with the SCURF account um, where we actually had David come in and lead a community call. And we did a reading group on this book because we thought it was very relevant for what we're doing at SCURF. Uh, because here, the whole idea of an impact network is sort of combining, you know, this thriving community with a healthy uh, operational focused organization. So how do you have sort of the heart and soul of a community while having the actual operational efficiency of an organization? And especially where uh, I really appreciate these ideas of shared principles, self-organization and trust, while still having a common aim, an operational backbone and a bias for action, which is a phrase that uh, I very much enjoyed and, and got from this book. And so here it's important to keep in mind as we're thinking of these impact networks and especially in the context of research, it's important to keep in mind different networks depending on their focus area and desired area of impact they're going to be effective at different scales, right? In a certain environment, maybe a network needs to be 20 people in a different environment that might need to be 2000 people, depending on the nature of the goal and what is actually sought after there. 
And very importantly, these networks don't need to accomplish everything in their entirety. It's in my own belief, I, I'm, you know, why I get excited about DAOs and Web3 is the whole idea of, well, how can we actually get people closer and closer to very focused areas of meaning and impact, and then think of networks of networks and layers of infrastructure around it to empower these things. All right, so I realized I was a long-winded couple of minutes on just context getting to the getting to the actual idea, but I, th I thought it was important putting that in place because for us at SCURF, we see these decentralized research centers as sort of this layer of these knowledge ecosystems. What are all the components uh, of, a, of a very focused area, right? Say we're just talking about a single research domain like governance, like cryptography, right? Single uh, intellectual domain, so to say, or, or research domain. And so... As we're thinking of these, there are these four kind of uh, components of this network layer that we're thinking of. And culture is sort of the thing that binds them all together across all of these. Because as you actually start unpacking what these mean, right, what, it, what is an intellectual layer? Well, that consists of research networks, review networks, publication networks, right? Today, a lot of the time review and publication are actually combined, right? If you're trying to publish in ACM or Elsevier or any of the major journals, right? You're getting review as part of your publication. There actually isn't much independent review uh, that is irrespective of publication. You know, there are the social layers, which has community, communication, and learning, right? Who's actually just communing around this, who's clearly trying to tell the world what's happening from either a media advocacy or explanation perspective. And then there's kind of the learning pathways. Of, well, who's creating the next generation of folks contributing to this overall uh, domain area? Uh, and then, you know, none of this would be possible without some money uh, being able to fund these actual activity and the times of the people uh, and paying for the time of the people doing this work. And very importantly, this operational layer, I think, is one that frequently gets neglected because ops is usually something that exists within a single organization. And I, I think that open source shows some very open source communities show some very interesting precedents and kind of examples of what, you know, open operational networks can look like because effectively, right, no open source project would actually work if there wasn't some kind of operational layer around that of people actually focused on, pro uh, on project management and who's doing what and let's roadmap and coordinate. So it is very important to not just have the folks who actually want to get their hands dirty in the research or do the validation and, and formal publication, but there's a lot of other elements that go into uh, what we're dubbing as sort of a knowledge ecosystem within a single domain. And so what does it mean to actually operationalize one of these? Because it's great to have theoretical ideas, but what does this actually look like in practice? So it's important to define the scale, the focus, as mentioned, the ops and funding, uh, and then to start putting together all of these different networks. Let me just jump into a concrete example. So right now, uh, the Dow Research Collective, uh, Metagov and SCURF, we are working together excuse me, I'm putting together a DAO research hub, which from the SCURF perspective is the first time that we're collaborating with a group of folks on building a decentralized research center specifically in the direction of DAOs and governance, right? So the, the name of this specific uh, center, so to say, is called the DAO research hub. Again, just DAOs and governance within Web3. Uh, and we're currently seeking some uh, funding to fund some grad students because while we have been already pulling together the existing research networks and we hosted an event at DEF CON and we just had a, a faculty member, a former faculty member from UC Dublin uh, who's written the ethnography of the DAO. Uh, he actually uh, worked with us to organize a Web3 workshop the other week uh, where we had around 70, 60 or 70 academics coming together. Uh, we're putting together uh, these three organizations on this slide. We're putting together uh, a, a DAO day, so to say, I'm forgetting what, what the formal name is that, that we decided on in the end, but uh, there's a three-day Stanford conference at the end of August. We're adding on September 1st a, a focus just on DAOs and governance. Uh, we're also working on for DevCon in, in October. We're going to be working with uh, a wide variety of organizations putting together a governance and crypto economics community hub there. And then in January, we're actually working with a group of academics to put together an academic conference, hopefully at, uh, at UCSD, at UC San Diego, uh, uh, in early January, which would be a lovely time for those of us who are living in cold climates to escape to San Diego for a little bit. But regardless, right, we have this series of events where we're going mostly academic, mostly industry, and we're kind of ping-ponging between the two. And we're able to tap a wide variety of folks who are already in the space 
To that, we want to add postdocs or grads who are already embedded at universities. We're talking to Stanford and Carnegie Mellon and a few others right now about possibly funding actual students there too, who can take data from these industry networks and collaborate with other university uh, and academic focused researchers. Uh, and coordinating with these funding and ops layers to actually get more public facing activity going on this and actually sharing with the world and not just you know increasing the volume of overall research, but really thinking about that facilitation, right? How do we go from having ideas to getting the ideas to the people who need them? And I think DAOs is an interesting one to highlight because I know when I got into the space in 2016, uh, there were a lot of folks, myself included, who on the DAO side got very excited in this new structure and it's going to change everything. And then people were like, oh, have you ever heard of a co-op? And again, myself included were, uh, wait, sorry, what's a co-op again? Can right? And that's a problem, right? People who are building DAOs absolutely need to know what a co-op is. Uh, just like today, uh, you know, people doing smart contract audit security should be aware of general cybersecurity primitives and standards in the Web2 domain, right? It's not bad to learn from previous precedent. So a lot of the time, the people who are actually building a product, they don't even know what is the full relevant set of information to them, right? So this facilitation isn't, oh, you're working on problem X, here's all the problem X related research. It's a much broader problem where the actual confines of what is relevant research is, is very ephemeral and fluid. It changes over time and is not something that is static. So I know I'm, I'm getting close to the 15 minute mark and I wanna make sure to leave some time for questions. So here, I, I just wanna show that, uh, you know, for a decentralized research center, um, the way we're thinking of it as SCURF is what we've been doing has been this kind of cross domain knowledge network layer, right? It's, it's clunky, there's gotta be better terms for it. We just haven't thought of it yet. So work with me. If you have ideas of how to better uh, package some of these, please let me know. And we are looking for folks to collaborate with. So please feel free to reach out if any of this is of interest to you. But what SCURF has been doing is this sort of foundational, right? We're not just focused on, on DAOs or on cryptography or on security, we care about Web3. So we're trying to be that foundational layer across all of these areas. But the challenge is, right, if we go to a tenured security faculty member and a cryptography faculty member and someone doing some version of DAOs and governance, sure, they would love to chat with each other, but they need to go deep in their own domain. So here, this, this idea of SCURF as this kind of foundation upon which these pillars into very specific dedicated topics can be built. And so the DAO Research Hub is the first attempt at building one of these decentralized research centers, these concrete focused pillars in a very specific direction that brings together all of those individuals. Uh, we're also doing a peer review experiment um, at the moment, but that's ready beyond the scope of this presentation. But if anyone is interested, I'm happy to share more about that. But pretty much with the DAO Research Hub, as mentioned, we're already starting on providing operational support. We've hired some folks into what we're calling community cross-pollinators. So what is the actual human layer of additional cross-pollination in addition to making the information available and trying to figure out what are the other resources that need to be available there? We're already thinking of what are the future decentralized research centers we're going to work on and who we're going to partner with. And at the end of the day, we absolutely have an infinite amount more of open questions than we do concrete answers. We are fundamentally wading into uncharted, or I don't want to say uncharted as if no one has ever thought about this, but no one has thought about systematizing this as a public good, right? There are versions of this, and we're trying to learn from very different innovative research environments and, you know, the Bell Labs and the Xerox Parks and the DARPAs and everyone else who's kind of created these very interesting and intriguing research and uh, just innovation and mindset change uh, environments. But what does it actually look like when you, when you have that in a decentralized fashion without one organization sitting in the middle of it? And so, again, there's a lot going on here. And at the end of the day, we are absolutely excited to have more folks to collaborate with, to speak with about this. And, you know, it's been a pleasure from my perspective and from our perspective as an organization and connecting with the Research Hub community. And we've had a couple of joint calls on, on peer review and everything else. So, yeah, very much kind of open call to action is if any of what I just said interests you, please reach out. I'm more than happy to chat and to see how we can collaborate. But I, I will stop there to at least leave a couple minutes for Q&A. Hey, Eugene, this is amazing. Thanks so much for the presentation. Um, I, I love that you all are focused on uh, like a bias for action with the research that you are focused on, um, like trying to build a product with the DAO attached. I, I almost feel like I could spend five to seven years just to learn about like community governance, like get a PhD in how to actually like operate a DAO, but like obviously do not have the time for that. So it's it's really cool that you guys are putting together like an organization that can help like make recommendations on how to like improve these sort of like community uh, DAOs. 
So I guess like uh, from like the couple of years that you guys have been uh, working on SCURF, what's like a recommendation that you've made where you've actually seen organizational change, you know, from this like research that has a bias to action? Yeah, so at, at the end of the day, also we're still kind of, you know, we've been around about a year and a half, uh, two years, and we're still figuring out the line. How much are we recommending specific courses of action versus giving people information and letting them choose their own adventure? Currently, we're much more on the latter, especially with the general ethos of Web3, right? We don't want to be a centralized. We're the ones that tell you how to DAO write or how to cryptography write or how to do something like that. Um, nonetheless, it's been really exciting to see how I think for us, just seeing how we're in the lucky position where we get to see a lot of people thinking about the same thing at a similar time point, and they're also focused on whatever their direct incentives are, whether it's building a new product, trying to work out an idea that we just get to be, you know, like, hey, knock on the door, like, let's let's pick our heads up and look across because there's four or five of you doing the exact same thing. So let's get on a call together and actually discuss what this looks like. And, you know, we're also able to do some uh, kind of closed door convening as well for folks that want to gather but are not as comfortable doing it publicly. And I see there was a, a question in chat on peer review. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll segue with an example and then talk about the peer review uh, uh, side of things for a moment. But, you know, around peer review specifically, we have our actual experiment, which Timothy I'll, I'll answer your question in a moment. Uh, and um, we have the actual experiment. We're building community and we're building this knowledge repository. So, you know, in my own very blunt, overly critical, you know, I'm, I'm always one to criticize myself and whatever I'm involved with much more uh, uh, aggressively than I would do for others. You know, I still think we have a far way to go. You know, I can come up with a few little examples here and there, but at the end of the day, I still personally think we have a very long road ahead of us in terms of truly seeing that kind of deep acceleration. And part of the challenge is even knowing what's the right information to get to people combined with the right culture, combined with the right facilitated interaction and workshops. So we're doing a lot of these things individually. Like we've had some little things come across of like, yay, this happened thanks to an interaction with SCURF. But on that kind of systematic level, I'm not seeing it at the scale. Uh, and Timothy, just to quickly answer your question on the peer review side, basically we're doing a super basic process. For now, round one is just on DAO and governance related research where uh, we're not using any special tooling, nothing like that. We just want to effectively establish a baseline process for what is the minimum amount of review to happen for something to have considered getting, having gotten open peer review, where we actually compensate the reviewers. So those are the major differences of what we're doing right now. Um, I can, yeah, I'll, as soon as I'm done chatting and once the next person's up, I'll, I'll drop a link and chat with a little more information about our experiment so you could learn, uh, so you could uh, read up on that and happy to chat later as well. Yeah, so so I guess just to like say one way in which SCURF, or SCURF has positively impacted Research Hub, um, you all have advocated for like kind of like cross pollination in contributors among these side projects, and so I think that's really nice in that um, like kind of every project is doing DAO governance in their own way at the moment, and when you have contributors who are part of like different communities, you can kind of uh, learn what works best and implement you know based on others like trial and error. Um, I know like some of like our best uh, kind of DAO community governance processes have come from um, just research hub users who have stepped up and said, hey, Pat, you know, you guys are not doing this well. Like there's like great precedent and other projects that I'm a part of that like could really improve like how research hub is operating. And so we have awesome people like Jeff and Ricardo who have, uh, you know, spent a lot of time and a lot of discords like learning on like how governance can operate and have improved ours. So yeah, the cross pollination I think is really important, and like I'm grateful for your organization kind of helping to champion that. I guess a another question that I have is like, I love the idea of decentralized research centers. Like we had a couple talks um, yesterday on decentralized clinical trials, and I think in general, just the ability for the average person to start doing molecular biology experiments is really on the rise. Like it's getting cheaper and easier every year. I guess um, do you have any like examples of decentralized research centers that have kind of popped up organically in the past like something you know that comes to mind when you brought that up was like the polymath project where like a bunch of mathematicians just randomly jumped into a forum and started figuring out like really complicated math uh proofs so yeah just curious if there's any like pre-existing organizations that you all draw inspiration from yeah it seems like the ones that 
I know a life for Ma's library is also one that I get really excited about from a different direction of just like annotating white papers and how to make research more understandable. You know, I, the polymath one is a great example of just these very focused, uh, you know, deep deep but narrow right it's not a group trying to solve all the world's problems they're looking at very specific mathematical problems and you know I, i'm forgetting some of the other ones in in the world of uh, some of the other hard hard sciences and bio and medicine and some others and i know you and i have also talked about just how subreddits you know like even there are some subreddits that are actually you know, like ask history is one of my favorite or ask historians i think it is one of my favorite subreddits and you know th there is a lot of great knowledge on there i think the challenge with a lot of these groups is they seem to operate massively well when there happens to be a certain threshold of motivated enough individuals, because the sad reality is, to my knowledge, at least a lot of those communities are purely volunteer passion based. And that's a beautiful thing, but you can't expect, uh, you know, 20,000 people around the planet to give 10 hours a week to something that's purely volunteer, especially if someone at the end of the chain is somehow actually finding a way to monetize that knowledge and, you know, uh, something comes out of that and they adjust the model, which goes into a product, which goes into the making someone a billionaire. And right, uh, the fact that there isn't that feedback loop back into open communities, I think, is one of the things that's been undercutting this, because there's a lot of examples, right, even stepping away from the research communities, there's a lot of examples of uh, tech companies that have multi-billion dollar evaluations uh, at the time when they have, you know, 10, 20, 30 people because they're mostly using open source tooling and then they don't kick anything back to the open source community once they get invested in. So uh, to take that to take that question slightly differently and thinking of what do we need to see more of these communities, we need to actually think of how who whose shoulders are we standing on to have gotten here? And if we are in a position to have some extra capital, how do we make sure to divert it to those communities so that more of those things can happen? Uh, because I know having worked at CMU also, there's a lot of people who come in with those stated intentions and then you get a totally different thing once you're in the middle of it. And you realize like, oh, you're really just working for your one main funder to solve a problem that they're having. And that's just a, a very different feel that does not feel as uh, pure on the intellectual side. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. So, so I guess another question that I have is like uh, for the year and a half or two that SCRP has been around, um, like I feel like uh, DAO governance and Web3 in general is like a super early stage field. And it's almost like every week there's like a new perspective on the best way to like help, you know, uh, DAOs run effectively. Um, can you talk about like any like evolving perspectives that you've had? You know, you mentioned like you started thinking about this in 2016, like kind of, yeah. How, how have your thoughts changed over the last like five, six years? Yeah. So, I mean, when I first got into it, I was just, you know, I feel like many people who are initially enamored by the possibilities and look at how great it is and people will work together and that will solve all of our problems of humaning. And um, yeah, just through both the the journey through DAOs and keeping an eye on the space and my own mental health journey uh, in parallel have had some interesting uh, combined learnings. Uh, and one of them is that humans don't like changing and change is very hard. And the, some of these stated desires and ethos of DAOs and how we're all going to be in these leaderless environments and we're all going to know when to step up and step back, all these things involve a certain level of personal change that I don't see as being systematized and following anywhere as close to, you know, the interest in what's going to the moon this week or something like that. So I think in terms of DAOs and governance, right, through, I'd say through DeFi summer, it was predominantly copy paste. You know, governance was like a 12th order consideration for most organizations. It's like governance, forget governance. We don't know how we're scaling. We don't know our consensus mechanism. We don't know this. We don't know that. Like we have all these tech issues. It, forget the people. We need the tech first. And between the DAO, though that was in 2016, I don't think that actually changed a lot of people's mentalities. It just made DAOs a dirty word for a while. Uh, and I, I know that because I was working on a DAO project on EduDAO, not, not the one that launched about a year ago. Uh, it was a different EduDAO focused in the Bronx. And like everyone loved what we were doing and, until we actually had to sign legal papers and then the lawyers would get scared off because there was no clarity on crypto at that time. But anyway, so a lot of governance was copy pasta through DeFi summer. Once all of a sudden DeFi summer in 2020 took place and all of a sudden you know what was a, a maybe a couple hundred thousand dollar a million dollar treasury turned into a billion dollar treasury within six to twelve months following all of a sudden there was a massive focus on governance and everyone was kind of racing to figure out what is the new version i'm personally super excited by what optimism is working on with their bicameral governance structure and i i just think that we need to keep evolving the see i don't want to say keep evolving the complexity because i don't want to imply that 
complexity for complexity's sake is a good thing, but we are dealing with an inherently complex problem. And I currently do not see how we can have a super easy solution to this uh, because at least we need to have more experimentation to suss out the nuances of exactly what are the problems we need to work through. And that's where like, I'm really excited to see optimism because something I've been thinking about for the last six to 12 months has been, well, how do we actually mix you know, gated expertise with the masses of whoever wants to focus on whatever without needing to you know, like be this high to ride kind of thing. And how do you have that mix of everyone is welcome, but at the same time, not everyone is dedicating the same time and attention to these core problems. So why does a person who spends three seconds here have an equal vote to the person who does nothing but think about this problem and really wants to see this place evolve over 20 years, whereas some of the people here for three seconds are just worried about going to the moon. So it's very interesting to also see and I think now, now that DeSci is much more of a thing than it was six to 12 months ago, right? This is where it's going to be interesting to compare DeFi governance with, say, refi DeSci governance, right? What's different when the fundamental intrinsic motivation towards the project changes? Like, I don't know how many people, and this is just my own bias because I'm not intrinsically motivated by financial products, right? Maybe some people are, maybe some people do wake up in the middle of the night being like, oh, you know, it's a better algorithm for making some more money. And like, I just can't empathize because that's not me, but I'm sure someone is wired differently like that. But I do know a ton of people who do have that kind of thing of like making knowledge better, you know, like solving these massive problems that don't have a clear way out. So I do think that this new experimentation of the bicameral, of um, of using soulbound tokens in different versions or non-transferable NFTs, of using much more intricate ways of actually tracking contribution and proportionally weighting to either expertise or contribution while still also giving a pathway for anyone who wants to hop in to still get involved. I think that is a very interesting domain. Uh, and you know, I, I think we're going to need a couple of years of experimentation. And I know at least I'm forgetting the names of some of the other projects, but I know a few folks have started uh, running their own experiments based off of what they're seeing in optimism. So I'm really excited in, in uh, the bicameral direction and those experiments, uh, and in specifically in terms of uh, soulbound tokens, non-transferable NFTs, and more reputation tools to, to improve how we work together. Yeah, amazing. Thanks for expounding. And for everybody in the audience too, Eugene's done like a whole lot of work helping to bring all the DSI projects together. So he's just been like an incredible asset, I think, to the field and helping to like have everyone be pushing in the same direction. So thanks again for the talk and for uh, kind of expounding on these decentralized research organizations. Yeah, of course. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And yeah, pleasure to be part of it. If anyone ever wants to chat, please feel free to find me on Twitter or elsewhere. And glad to see Shadi up next. Thank you, Eugene. That was that was really great. Thank you for, for, thank you for joining Shaikon. Uh, so yeah, up next, we have uh, Shadi. So a brief intro to, to Shadi, Shadi um, Eldamati holds PhD in neuroscience from Georgetown University, where he worked at the intersection between com uh, computational science, cognitive neuroscience, and biomedical engineering in the interest of the advancements of human society. Shadi founded Obsentia to, have, to achieve this vision, uh, building on 10 years of method development and digital infrastructure for big data and neuroscience research. On a personal note, uh, Shadi is also one of the first people I met when I was moving my first step into this size. So I'm really excited to have you, uh, Shadi, today. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, at SciCon. Thank you. Um, it's so good to see uh, friends in, in this space. And it's amazing to really track the development of something that was just perhaps whispers across the internet. Uh, and here we are all together online. Uh, and talking about real, real implications of how web native communities can change how we do science. Um, so today I have a bit of a um, more scholarly, perhaps research based approach. I, I want to talk a little bit about um, mechanism design in DSI and some really kind of high level topics regarding primitives. And so a little bit of context, uh, thank you for the intro. I'm glad that I don't have to talk myself up. I really appreciate it. Um, so as, as a part of OpSci, the work that we've been doing, thinking really carefully about mechanism design, architecture design patterns, what does the DSI stack look like? Um, and how, how do all of the different pieces, can we identify the individual primitives or pieces? Uh, yeah, so can we identify these uh, primitives and how do they all fit together? And what are the consequences or of the different decisions we need to make as we deploy these things. Um, so in summary, what I'll talk about today, I wanna to make sure that, um, you know, maybe I'll get, bring out this concept at the beginning and then we'll revisit it again at the end. So I'll cover 
discovery, how it's traditionally been uh, applied throughout scientific history um, with a very specific example of how discovery really is a recursive arc, right? So there's, you can't chart discovery as a linear or even like a, you know, a traditional standard nonlinear exponential model, but it's probably something much more complicated than that. Um, then I'll also talk about something called positivism and how positivism, being aware of its consequences and, and role in the history of the philosophy of science is something that we should revisit um, as we're designing these DSI DAOs uh, for autonomous knowledge curation. Uh, and lastly, I'll cover some just basic uh, reflections or ideas on what these design uh, DSI primitives are. And again, this is an open question, and this is something that we're going to have to solve as we're moving forward. And so don't take anything as authoritative uh, in this work. And yeah, so let me let me just hop right into it. Um, yeah, so so I kind of alluded to this already, right? This concept that discovery is a recursive arc. And what this means is the, the path that we chart to discover what is real and what isn't real and how it impacts our lives is driven primarily through falsification, right? So that's at the heart of the scientific method. If you can disprove something, or if you have a model that's set up to disprove things, this is going to drive your explanatory power over time, right? And it's a little bit counterintuitive. It's like, oh, no, my model should prove things. My model should uh, explain and make predictions. However, deep within the philosophy of, uh, of, of, of logic, of mathematics, of computer science, you have some fundamental results that maybe we can cover in a little bit more detail that you know, TLDR states, the models that we construct to explain the world, depending on their explanatory power, are always going to end up with paradoxes or contradictions. And if we make them such that they explain everything, especially so. Um, so a really great example of this uh, recursive arc is the cultural inertia, and I guess like, yeah, this cultural inertia that science had to and you could say a decentralized science uh, had to overcome in the transition from the practice of science as alchemy to chemistry. And this was a multi, you know, century progressive march forward. And, you know, you could argue that this was an example of really low tech decentralized science, right? So you had all of these individuals all throughout the world doing different types of experiments at the same time, uh, corresponding about them, you know, with incredible time lags between when the results are known and when they're not known. So for a little bit more context, uh, when we were in, in the, in the um, some of the first models to emerge regarding kind of the composition of the natural world were emerged Emerged from, uh, emerged from al alchemical uh, studies. So this idea that there are basic elements in the world, and this goes all the way back to Greek philosophy, right? Uh, of like different types of forms, or like platonic, uh, specifically like platonic forms. Uh, so a great, um, right around the, the, the 15, uh, uh, late 1600s, this gentleman, J.J. Uh, Becher, uh, he made a really influential, he wrote a really influential uh, document that took these alchemical forms to try to explain the question, how do these things burn? Uh, took these alchemical forms and modified them to explain how the, this question of how, how do things burn? So, you know, he's famous for saying that there's three types of earth uh, as well as air, fire, and water. And these are pure forms, like air is air. Um, so this was really, really significant. Uh, later on, uh, Stahl, uh, a different um, uh, early chemist or alchemist, if you want to call him that, he identified that uh, this third form of earth called terra pingus, which is this like waxy, oily sort of substance that forms during oxidation as we know it now today, uh, he identified it as phlogiston. Uh, and phlogiston was supposed to be this chemical that is consumed or released or facilitates fire, facilitates burning. And it's really interesting because in the beginning, this kind of emerged out of experiments. So you know, if you, um, you know, you could like extinguish a flame by capping it, uh, by, by making sure that all the phlogiston is expended, right, within that system. And so, you know, this, this theory started to pick up a lot of steam. And by uh, the early 1700s, this individual named Potts uh, started writing and, and condensing and synthesizing a lot of these basic observations and theories 
for a mass for 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 mass audience consumption, right? So he wrote all the TLDRs and he said, "Hey, everyone, fire is phlogiston," and this became the dominant form of thought for like 100, 100 years, just about. Um, and it wasn't overturned until uh, this really famous chemist, uh, you guys might know him, Priestley, uh, discovered that actually oxygen is something that exists. And he incorrectly assumed that oxygen is just dephlogisticated air. So he, the fact that experimental evidence couldn't continue to support the existence of a specific chemical called phlogiston or a specific substance called phlogiston, right? Something that emits and it's like per per permeates all of um, the air and, and, and the universe. It's just something that's part of the fabric of the universe was uh, kind of this convergence that people came to. Uh, to the point where it was like the experimental evidence was very, it was very difficult to observe those things. And so it resorted to becoming a process and Priestley, incorrect, Priestley incorrectly surmised that, hey, oxygen is just what happens when you dephlogisticate air. Uh, it wasn't until uh, Lavoisier uh, actually discovered oxygen and uh, founded the modern field of uh, chemistry before he got his head chopped off in the, in the French Revolution. And really gave us this conceptual framework that was completely different and revolutionary from what had come before, which is this concept of uh, chemical reactions and uh, laying the path forward for uh, uh, chemical structures and the emission of energy during chemical reactions. So, you know, these early decide primitives that these individuals kind of relied on, right, was the ability to observe, uh, perturb, and synthesize before doing it all over again, right? So you observe a system, you see what you, you measure, what you can measure, um, you synthesize those measurements, you perturb the system to see what, how it responds in different conditions, and then you observe again and you keep repeating the same process. And so this is rooted in a philosophical, um, I guess, school of thought called positivism, which basically states that um, anything that's rational uh, is real and anything that's real is rational to quote Hegel. Right, so if you can observe it, it probably exists. If you can't observe it, it doesn't exist. And this became a pretty mod, uh, dominant doctrine for quite a while uh, until the emergence of quantum mechanics, right? So Einstein was a really famous uh, opponent of, of uh, logical positivism in, in uh, the philosophy of science because he was very intimately aware that there are things that we can't observe that we know exist, like electrons or quarks or the Higgs boson, right? We can only measure shadows of them, um, the Higgs boson much, much, much later on. So, so why, why am I even talking about this? Why is this important? Um, positivism, I think, is something and its history and how it was successful and how it failed is really, really important to keep in mind when we think about automating knowledge systems. So specifically in DSI, you know, we uh, have a definition that I've thrown up there. Um, there's many, many definitions out there, but I think we would probably all agree that at least the sub definition, apologies, uh, a sub definition would be, um, DSI could be characterized as this web native movement to bring the practice of science, you know, into a digital space where individuals could deploy scientific applications on decentralized internet protocols, right? So these are public goods. They don't run on any particular trusted party. Uh, they're distributed, they're autonomous, they're community owned, and they have some really interesting key properties, right? So that they're on these distributed consensus networks that have deterministic criteria where knowledge curation is an engineered process, right? It kind of taking this concept of science and software to the, to the limit. Um, and this is underlined by things like linked and verified content, right? So being able to cryptographically uh, generate proofs that a particular object or a particular observation is that observation that came from that source. So reducing noise as uh, reducing noise in the communication of, of results all the way from observation to dissemination and published papers. Some other uh, key properties are things like algorithmic grant making. So how do you actually chart uh, a problem or a hypothesis space and allocate resources to different parts of it so that you maximize your odds of finding the lowest local minima in that entire space? Like how do you find theories that are the most powerful in their, expl uh, 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 in their explanations and how do you allocate resources to accelerate that convergence? And a big part of this is economic engineering, right? Where you perhaps match decentralized service providers, everything from peer review, curation, uh, contract research organizations to run your PCRs with scientists that are interacting in this web native community. So, so you know, if we kind of take a step back and think about um, this, you know, early primitive uh, DSI design pro or DSI process, right? Where you 
are linking observation with synthesis and perturbation as, as part of this convergence uh, towards an explanatory model. So it's, it's, it's really important to, to remember that automation is really, once, once things are, made, are automated, they're gonna be really efficient at what they do, especially in a deterministic system. A determining system is gonna do what it's intended to do. And incentive mechanisms, especially for in economic systems, will converge to equilibria. And these equilibria can be self-reinforcing, right? Um, and maybe I can give some examples of this in a minute. So keeping in mind that synthesis is always gonna be constrained by the resolution of our telescopes, uh, by the statistical power of the observations we're able to make, and economic incentives that are dependent on that synthesis will lead to equilibrium points, right? And one key, key risk here is that poorly designed systems or systems that are designed for one purpose and applied for a different purpose, like across scientific fields, have, have a risk of getting trapped in a local minima, right? Or these self-referential models like phlogiston, um, except imagine that phlogiston had an economic system to maintain its, uh, its presence or its, um, to maintain its, um, yeah, to maintain its significance, right? So like imagine you had journals that would only make uh, publications available that re regard phlogiston or grant making institutions that wanted to explore phlogiston and, and, and the way that it was defined is in a very self-referential referential way. So you could have like a really elaborate complex model with self-referential claims that all seem true, but in reality don't provide any further explanatory power. Uh, if you're interested in kind of thinking more about autonomous protocols and exploring these concepts in more detail, do check out this paper that we wrote with uh, the Active Inference DAO, which synthesizes a top-down and a bottom-up approach of science to think about what is deep, like what is deep and wide protocol system design look like for knowledge engineering. And there's a, there's a lot there. It's, it's a very, I think, um, it's, it's a very young field and it has a lot of interesting intersections with uh, um, models and, 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 and research and, and artificial general intelligence. And when we go into that, into that paper a little bit. So uh, let me see how I'm doing on time. Okay, I think I'm good. Uh, so what, what do modern DSI primitives look like? Okay, so these are my suggestions here, uh, kind of collapsing across the different components that we would use to build these DSI uh, autonomous science protocols. And these are primitives that we need to keep in mind when we're designing for explanatory power and avoiding some of these pitfalls, right? So um, at its core, we have things, at the core of DSI, we have community, right? It's decentralized because there's people out there that want to connect, that want to do research, that want to work together, and culture is what bridges, bridges them together. This also includes, you know, not just individuals, but the existing scientific status quo, right? So labs, institutions, governments, uh, focused research organizations, right? So that whole ecosystem or, um, you know, that kind of that pond that has all of the different types and you know life forms that are working together to interact and decide uh, decide what are good research questions and how to how to evaluate them. Um, so these the community I believe is pretty much uh, at the heart of this, and funding and grant making is what allows this community to do what they do, right? As opposed to getting a job, uh, and especially thinking about uh, alternative funding mechanisms like fast grants or crowdsourcing. Um, you know, tokenomic, tokenomic sorts of systems or crypto economics. Um, and then also there's a role for traditional government grant making as well as philanthropic uh, uh, proceeds. Uh, and of course, you know, as we've been seeing in, in kind of a recent trend, uh, the role of equity and venture capital in uh, merging these crypto economic systems with uh, commercialization and, and applied research. So we also have execution. Uh, execution are going to be basically the primitives that allow us to observe and perturb um, uh, systems. So these would be, for example, decentralized networks of research laboratories, uh, maker spaces, community labs, uh, institutions, uh, and other service, uh, service markets, like for example, what LabDAO is doing. Um, coordination, right? So this is kind of a super category of all the mechanisms that we require to be able to uh, debate and converge to uh, specific models or specific understandings that's shared about shared across the community, right? Like, how do we actually assess problems and how do we, you know, identify weaknesses and strengths of different explanatory models? And that's, I think, kind of at the heart of what's happening at Research Hub. So this includes things like, 
you know, snapshots, uh, you know, sentiment signaling and different types of forms or mechanisms of forms and polling. Uh, DAOs and sub-DAO models are really interesting here as well. Uh, asymmetric kind of comms, like so the ability to um, put a lot of people together, bring a lot of people together on the same page through these like web native you know, mechanisms like Telegram's a great, maybe terrible example of one, uh, Discord's in that, in that, in that uh, mechanism as well. So it's, it's, I think, you know, thinking of those things together as providing a set of tools that allow us to build a coordination, uh, tools for coordination to establish community and culture uh, and be able to do things like execute research that's been funded. Uh, the last two components, I'm just gonna briefly uh, bridge over and I think they're pretty, really, really important, which is uh, synthesis, which we've been talking about, but thinking specifically in a modern context where we have these reproducible knowledge objects uh, that allow us to do things like meta-analysis, allow us to build discourse graphs that track how a conversation changes over time so that we can take a step back and ask the question, you know, how does fire really burn? You know, what, what is oxygen? What is phlogiston? And this, this is going to be really dependent on looping in the rest of the community, bringing them all up on the same page, communicating scientific results through publishing and sharing. Um, and I think, you know, some of the key components for publishing are things like uh, cross references across different avenues, right? So the existing legacy systems have to be plugged into DSI. We need to have mechanisms for plugging into, into Crossref, into Scopus, um, uh, the DOI system, and building into those feedback mechanisms that allow us to weight the importance of different research results. So, so when we're thinking of engineering knowledge curation, right? So this ability of making scientific uh, discourse more automated, more uh, programmed around specific outcomes and metrics. My argument is that we should do so around uh, maximizing the propensity of falsification or the power of falsification. So what I mean by this um, is that those, those protocols or mechanisms or tools that allow us to more quickly iterate and converge on the boundary on, on the on the boundary limits of the particular space that we're trying to describe, the more likely we're going to be able to build something that's actually useful. And you know these primitive design principles regarding how we do that, this should be done out in the open. So builders, different types of communities should come together and document some open source design principles for their primitives, whether it's uh, an astronomical community that requires very specialized hardware and software for converting signals from the James Webb te uh, telescope into um, objects that can be manipulated by any scientist around the world, right? And plugged into existing academic discourse uh, in a digitally native seamless fashion, right? Kind of like thinking about what DSI Labs is doing with DSI nodes as an example. It's also really important to kind of get away from this uh, tyranny of a holistic solution or the eminence, the eminence of a holistic solution. There's never going to be one DSI DAO. There's never going to be one solution or one protocol or one set of parameters that's going to fit all these, all, you know, all, all, all fields of science, right? Because um, different knowledge problems are going to require different primitive configurations and different embeddings, right? Like in terms of how that research is funded, what its time horizon for impact is, um, its you know, reliance on specific types of precision or specific types of data. And so we don't wanna fall into a trap where we're designing economic mechanisms that uplift certain types of science, for example, like biotech, and perhaps you know, suppresses or ignores other types of systems or other types of scientific fields of inquiry like uh, social psychology, um, like you know, behavioral economics uh, and so on and so forth. So, and keeping in mind all along the way that failure should be considered a virtue. We should be building these systems again to fail. And the faster we do this, and and the more quickly we are able to chart quantitatively boundary conditions for these different types of DSI protocols, um, the better off that we will be. Uh, just kind of really hammering in that point again. So, so that's. That's all I have to say for today. These are kind of thoughts that um, have been coming up in some of the research I've been doing, thinking about uh, basic protocol system design and how do we build autonomous uh, knowledge curation protocols and thinking about dissemination uh, and, 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 and what are some good primitives uh, for that. So there's a lot more under the surface here. Uh, you know, if you want to get involved in this stuff, join a practicing DSI DAO. And you know, ask yourself questions. What are the tools that are being implemented here? How are how is the community uh, 
executing sense making in a distributed uh, fashion? How are they taking those observations and synthesizing them? What are their tools for perturbation? Um, and I think it's really important to practice uh, um, kind of intentionality and understand that this is going to be a convergent process with many failures along the way. Uh, and yeah, help us design some primitives and deploy the DCI-SAC architecture. There's an active conversation going on. Check it out at hack.opside.io. Um, you can also check out our blog on pulse.opside.io to kind of get a feeling for how we're thinking about these things. Um, and yeah, no, I don't want to take up any more time. So thank you for letting me wax philosophical on you guys on this Sunday. Appreciate it. If you have any questions, you can uh, post them after this as well on the Opside forums. Okay, thank you so much, Shadi. That was that was really interesting. Thank, thank you again for you know bringing your perspective on autonomous uh, DeSci protocols. So um, as you said, uh, since we're running a bit behind, I would uh, ask you know anyone that has a question. I don't see any for the moment in the in the Q and A. But uh, if you have any question, you know uh, please reach out to Shadi. Uh, again, uh, it's been it's been a really interesting. I think it's a really interesting topic, especially for uh, when you know DeSci goes into uh, you know people start to learn more about DSI and how they could actually, you know, implement all of these things. That would definitely be, you know, there's going to be a learning curve there, but I think it's really important that we start to bring this more and more into the traditional, you know, uh, academic system. So thank you again, Shetty, for, for coming up today to SciCon 2022. Thank you for the invite. So uh, next up, we're really lucky to have Eric Van Winkle, uh, who's a core member of the DSI Labs team focused on operations and community. His background is in applied organizational design, product development, and operations. Uh, Eric was also one of the core members of Constitution DAO, so tons of experience uh, building distributed communities uh, kind of aimed towards public goods. Um, the title of his talk uh, is Converting Intellectual Capital to Social Capital. Rebuilding communication pathways between scientists and the general public. So, Eric, great to have you. Um, good to see you again. Hey, Patrick. It's good to see you too. This has been an amazing conference to get to listen to. I particularly love everything that Eugene and Shadi just presented on, and a little sad that I'm coming right after them, but that's okay. Uh, really uh, excited to talk to people about reconnecting. Uh, the general public and science. So for reference, this is a topic that I'm incredibly passionate about. I'm not a PhD myself, always wanted to be one, but pretty quickly figured out in college that uh, was possibly going to spend more time chasing grant money than I was actually doing research and was recommended by a couple of friends and family not to go for it. So excited to have found DSI and this incredible group of people to kind of continue working through science and continue trying to bring it to the forefront of humanity and you know anything that anyone talks about. So what I wanna talk about today is something that's top of my mind on a regular basis. I grew up in the Southeastern United States, which for those of y'all who don't know, is typically a hotbed for misinformation. And it's the kind of thing that tears people, friendships, families apart. There are a lot of problems that come out of this, and it's something that I've been wanting to solve for a very long time. So the moment that I saw the work that DSI Labs was doing and the larger DSI space, I didn't really have a choice but to jump in. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is converting intellectual to social capital and how we can use this DSI movement to try and rebuild some of the communication pathways between scientists and the general public. So it's one thing to rebuild the pathways between science enthusiasts and scientists. But as we saw during the COVID pandemic, we actually do need to rebuild pathways between the entirety of the general public. Because a lot of the problems that we face in today's society are wildly complex and require extensive coordination to have any kind of an impact. So I think that DSI has a lot of potential to move forward with that and to make a meaningful difference in this space. So the first thing that I wanna talk about is different kinds of capital that exist in the world. And what you're seeing right now is just one framework. There are quite a few out there, but I think it does a good job of explaining where I want to go with this. So you can almost think of these different forms of capital as a type of language, where the base capital of the world is undoubtedly financial capital. How much money can this make? 
how much is that going to increase my quality of life? That's going to determine whether or not I do something. But as Eugene kind of mentioned earlier in this call, he doesn't value financial capital nearly as highly as he values other forms. Intellectual was the one that he put out there first and foremost. And I think it's important to realize that all these forms of capital have different allocation and valuation preferences for different groups. And that if you think of them as a language, if you're someone who values intellectual capital and you're trying to speak to someone who values social capital, you are quite literally speaking a different language. It's something where it's not that you're not saying the right words, it's that there's no possible way that it can come across. So as we start to think about how to rebuild the connections and trust with the general public, we need to be aware of this difference in language, of this difference in culture, and of this difference in capital allocation and valuation preferences. So academia tends to value intellectual capital. As someone who's coming into the space, just seeing it for the first time, the, I guess, importance of citations has kind of hit me in the face like no other. Your ability to come up with an innovation determines your career. That being said, the general public, while they do value intellectual capital, their base capital is going to be much, much closer to social. You could also make an argument for cultural capital, but I, I personally believe that it's social. And one thing that we kind of see is that there's no efficient conversion between these two. There's no direct translation between intellectual capital and social capital. And that leads to a lot of problems because what one group values heavily, the other doesn't necessarily value quite as heavily. That leads to a lot of miscommunications and a breakdown in these communication pathways that leads to eventual mistrust and people not taking the COVID vaccines. Um, one of the things that I see as being wildly powerful in the decentralized science movement is the ability to reconnect intellectual and social capital. And I'll go through a little bit more of how to do this, how I think we can do this in the near future. But I wanna say that the current method of conversion goes through financial capital. And it can in some ways be thought of as VC. It can be thought of as manufacturing and invention. Yes, I may not understand quantum mechanics, but my iPhone works and that's pretty cool. So having this financial capital as the intermediary gives losses in information as it travels through the larger system. So DSI being able to bridge these two groups has a lot of power. Moving on from that, I think that DSI has the ability to convert between intellectual and social capital. And as I was thinking about it over the past few weeks, it kind of breaks down into three distinct phases. And it's similar to what Shadi was just talking about in primitives, and I think Patrick and Eugene even touched on it in talks earlier today as well. So backbone infrastructure would be the very foundation of intellectual capital. Things like DSI nodes, where we are building the actual Web3 native unit of knowledge that a piece of information can live in. Something like Holonet from Opsi which can form the reputation and kind of identity and access management system, all of these different pieces of infrastructure can form the basis of intellectual. But in the same way that someone, a scientist, may not necessarily be able to read every single paper in their field, a member of the general public is not going to be able to read every single paper in science. It's just not going to happen. So it's incredible to have this base currency, this backbone infrastructure like DSI nodes, but it's important to realize that there are other steps in converting. The next step above that, as I see it, would be social scientific networks. It would be groups of people, whether they are PhDs, whether they are enthusiasts, or whether they're just regular Joes coming together in pursuit of a better world. And shout out to Research Hub for first off putting on this conference, but second, for building one of the most robust and powerful scientific social networks in the DSI space today. It was also really exciting to see Eugene's talk on a lot of the work that they're doing on Web3 web specific scientific social networks. 
Then finally, experiential value, public outreach, digital museums. Some of these experiential concepts are what really bring people into science. And I'll go through it in a later slide, but you need to be able to get your hands in there. You need to be able to experience it for yourself. And Web3 and the metaverse have the potential to enable that. So next slide would be the backbone infrastructure. We need to think about how we remake intellectual capital in the digital world. Uh, backbone infrastructure uh, is kind of the basis for this. So we need a Web3 native unit of knowledge. And Chris is going to be presenting on DSI nodes, I think two or three talks from now. So I won't go too far into that because I don't want to steal his thunder here, but we need to think about how replication and quality science are being built into the very foundation of intellectual capital. We need to think about how we're making this open, how we're making it verifiable, how we're distributing ownership among people, how we're bringing funding in, this larger scientific system and the backbone infrastructure behind it forms the basis for intellectual capital. But as I said earlier, no one's gonna go in and read every single paper. Very few people have time. So the next point is scientific social networks that can facilitate the conversion between intellectual and social capital. It's open communities of people who are passionate about a subject. Maybe exclusively PhDs, maybe exclusively average Joes, but every single Joes and Janes, excuse me, I keep saying that. Every single time that someone comes into one of these networks, they're working to push forward. Now, these networks can be used for a variety of different purposes. They can do curation and validation at scale. They can provide services to the larger scientific community that help advance human knowledge. They can do things like educational content creation. Uh, I will say, I think we have one of the best communication arms that we have ever had for science in the history of time. I, <laughs> it's a little nerdy, but I tend to fall asleep watching YouTube videos from this one guy named Niall Red, who makes the most incredible chemical reactions and just has a great way of explaining how things are done. Now, I would not call myself an expert on organic chemistry, but it's enough to get me interested. And having some of those networks to actually facilitate that information is incredibly powerful. But finally, we need to work towards experiential value. And that's one thing that I'm hoping the DSI can start thinking about in the near future. So growing up, I would learn about science through parents and teachers who would give me hands-on examples. You build the balsa wood bridge, you make the volcano out of you know, baking soda and vinegar, you go on a walk with a family member and they quiz you on algebra. It's actually being hands-on and in the middle of science. Now, one thing that the scientific social networks can facilitate is people being in there, but there are many, many, many more ways that we can do this. One of the ways that I think is the most powerful is utilizing the metaverse properly. This concept of a digital metaverse that facilitates science and education has been around for quite some time. It's been a common theme in sci-fi over the years, but I think that DSI can actually build that. I think that we can make a stunning digital vista where knowledge can be, where, where we're building experiences around the very foundation of knowledge, around the Web3 native unit of it, where we're recombining science and art into something beautiful that people can come in and interact with, and where we're enabling education through digital mediums of future generations. So I was out at a uh, dinner with family the other day, and two little nieces, we're both playing on their iPad. I go up to them, Courtney, Savannah, well, what are you playing? What are you doing? Oh, we're playing Minecraft. It's like, wait, they have that on iPads? Oh, that's awesome, cool. Um, every single or a, a large portion of the next generation of scientists will be web native. That's something that I think everyone in this conference knows and that we can use to our advantage through the power of VR and AR we can create incredible worlds that they can go explore, the next generation of Minecraft, 
we can take some of these base units of knowledge and use them to build out places for interaction, for questions, and for learning. We can take some of the decentralized education movement that's just now starting to pop up. If any of y'all haven't heard of it, it's a, it's a cool one. Um, and build temples to learning in this, this larger digital world. To me, I think that this experiential digital science is where we really reconnect with the general public, is how we work to solve some of the larger societal issues that we see popping up on a daily basis. Um, I know we're running a little bit behind on time, so I'm gonna do my best to kind of uh, speed things up for y'all. We'll quickly go to Q&A, if that's okay with you, Ricardo. I uh, do want to close out by saying thank you, thank you, thank you to Patrick and Ricardo and the entire Research Hub team for putting on this conference. If you'd like to join the conversation, here is a QR code that links to our Discord, and we'd love to have you there. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Uh, that was really cool and excited for Chris's uh, presentation later on DSI Nodes. Um, so just in the interest of time, we just have one question, and then we'll move on to the Women in Web 3 talk next. But uh, Joanna in the audience uh, asks if you foresee a marketplace for social capital eventually. I foresee a marketplace for social capital. So I was actually debating with a friend about this not too long ago out in Austin. I think anywhere that we can enable markets in Web3, we're probably going to. So I would be surprised if there already is, if there isn't one that already exists today. That being said, an efficient market for social capital would be a difficult but interesting thing to try and enable. I think Lens Protocol kind of does this to an extent as you would have to pay someone to follow them and to learn about their tweets, but there's so many other forms of social capital. It's not just the communication pathways, it's trust, it's networks, it's, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. I would be interested to see, and I would be shocked if things along those lines don't start popping up in the not too distant future. Great. Well, thanks so much for uh, being here today, um, Ricardo. Thank you, Eric. It was really a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Okay, so headed to um, our next guest. So we actually have a panel session. So let me bring in all of the panelists. Let me just do a brief introduction. So uh, we have a panel uh, session with uh, women in Web3, uh, Web3 Women in Science. And uh, the mission of uh, Web3 Women uh, in Science is to address the critical underrepresentation of women at the end at the intersection of science and Web3, uh, sometimes referred to as DSI uh, for decentralized science. So uh, with uh, the W3WS or tenants are uh, serving as an efficient uh, pipeline to onboard uh, women into novel and existing, and, and existing DSI organizations and serving as the Web3 evolution of a labor union, providing the support needed to keep women in the space once they arrive. So uh, with that said, I'll leave the floor uh, to you. All right. Well, as we wait to get um, Aaron on, I'll just do a brief introduction of myself and um, thank you to all of Research Hub for inviting us here to do this talk. We are very excited to be here. My name's Ariella. Um, by day, I'm an MD PhD candidate at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, I study, among other things, medicine and the genetics of aging. And I joined the decentralized science space about a year ago. Um, I've always moonlighted as a science writer and illustrator, and I started doing that kind of work, same exact kind of work in the decentralized science space. And um, while there, I noticed that there was a lack of diversity. Um, it's a pretty homogeneous community, and it was hard to find a lot of women, especially as speakers at conferences like these. And I thought it would be good, a good idea to start an organization to help recruit more women and support more women and amplify their voices. And, uh, you know, we all know that diverse teams are successful teams and we all want as many people in this space as possible. So I think, uh, you know, this is, these kinds of movements should be uh, celebrated to make DSI the most successful. And on that note, it's a uh, this topic of onboarding scientists is very near and dear to our hearts at Web3 Women in Science. It's what we want to do. And so I'm really pleased to take you through a whole panel today 
where we'll do a little whirlwind tour of three phases of onboarding and considerations for making the process as effective as possible, which of course involves being as inclusive as possible. Um, so briefly, I just want everyone to recognize the faces that I have up here with me. Um, there's Talissa. Um, Talissa is a PhD candidate in microbiology. You also might know her on Twitter um, for running the account DSci Chatter, where she uh, sends us a lot of tweets all the time about events coming up and really keeps an eye on how the whole space is evolving, especially by following the DSci hashtag. And she's also more recently become a DSci World contributor um, and is working really hard on onboarding at that platform as well as at uh, uh, Web3 Women in Science. And next we have, we'll have talk to Kendall. And um, whereas with Talissa, we'll be focusing a lot on how to reach out to communities worldwide. Kendall, I'm very excited to have on a panel because a lot of times we're sitting here talking about how to onboard more scientists. And Kendall is actually my classmate um who we are in the process of recruiting and so we can ask a scientist who's about halfway through the process of being onboarded and recruited how it's going so far what factors are pulling her in or pushing her away and what she wants to see for the future um and it, then finally i'm very pleased to have aaron um aaron has a very extensive background as a serial entrepreneur um, at the intersection of community, technology, and startups. And currently, she's operations lead at Talent DAO. Talent DAO is super dope because it's actually a DAO studying DAOs. It's very meta. Um, and it's really important to have her perspective as an expert on what it takes to keep people engaged um, once they are recruited. So, with those brief introductions, let's just dive in and start with. Um, Talissa, let's talk about how um, how DSI is reaching people all over the world. So, Talissa, do you think that existing scientific institutions are doing a good job of capturing the world's scientific potential? Uh, yeah, thank you, Ariel, for the introduction. I'm excited to be here with you all. Um, I'll be upfront and say that I think that science has long been this activity um, that is elite and it's dominated by, by the elite and we uphold this history today through academia. Um, it's often that science is not considered you know, good or credible unless it's tied to an investigator who is a part of or adjacent to the academic institution. Um, so consequently, the good science that gets funded and published and, and um, put out into the world is biased towards these Eurocentric thought systems or towards major scientific monopolies or corporations that have buy-in um, or, you know, old veteran generations of scientists who have accumulated all of the status uh, within their fields over their tenure, um, even simply just towards resources and literature that is exclusively published in the English language, right? Um, you know, as Ariella said, I, I'm a PhD candidate myself. I've been a pawn of academia for quite some time now. Um, and despite many of the privileges that I alone have, I still feel removed from the institution because I present as a woman of color or because I don't come from a certain uh, academic legacy. And, you know, because I resist assimilating into science academia. <laughs> uh, um, and so, you know, I do feel this disconnect in a place where science is apparently opportunistic uh, and diverse. And so it's inevitable that this can be felt kind of wide, more widespread, you know, across the globe in different pockets. Um, so no, I don't think traditional science is doing its best to capture the world's full scientific potential. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And like super briefly, I lived in Japan for several years and Japan is hardly you know, a desert of scientific innovation. It's a highly developed country. And, but even there, just the lack of access to the English language, my job was to translate and, you know, write our papers for them. And you could see just how much extra burden there was to go to professional groups to have everything they've done translated and retranslated and edited. And it's a huge barrier. Even just the English language can be a huge barrier. Um, but so to move on, how do you think that DSI might be able to address, you know, these pitfalls that you've mentioned in traditional science? And like, do you think that's already happening? Um, do you think we're already doing better in DSI or not quite yet? Um, so, you know, DSI is really cool. It's new and we're using it to focus in on using blockchain technology to restructure the actual systems of science. 
But, you know, technology aside, we're also essentially rebuilding the scientific community as we know it, right? Um, and with that, there's this opportunity to shift the culture of science and what it means to be a scientist. Uh, I think it's important to leverage DSI as a movement um, that will make participation and discovery of science accessible, regardless of someone's educational background, language, um, socioeconomic status, age, uh, because I don't necessarily think that uh, that DSI is going to replace traditional science in its entirety. Um, so, you know, what if participation in DSI essentially just trickles down to greater scientific literacy and cultural engage or critical engagement um, in traditional science? So, you know, I'll say that I don't think we're at this level yet where we can start like pushing forward into these higher level applications of DSI, like on a cultural and socio uh, societal standpoint. But I do think many of us have good intentions and we're trying to think about this, but it's going to take a real effort and challenge to break down what we already have come to recognize as the convention of science alone, but also Web3, which is yet another a uh, cis male dominated community with its own conventions and jargon and exclusionary barriers. Sorry, after years on Zoom, you think I would have mastered <laughs> unmuting, but so what concrete actions do you think are necessary to make DSI more globally inclusive? Um, you know, despite the fact that we do have ways to go, uh, the hopeful side of me is that it feels really attainable that we can do these things because we have members of the community that have good intentions to, to break down these barriers. Um, and, you know, for example, we suddenly have this ability to participate in science asynchronously through Web3 platforms and like online collaborative communities like Twitter and Discord, despite what you think about them. <laughs> um, these are just tools that are always available. And this alone opens up this whole new layer of participation that doesn't necessarily exist or is rarely validated in traditional science. Um, you know, and so thought systems or ideas that are otherwise underrepresented or unavailable by a uh, way of traditional science are now being put into this very collaborative floor um, and, you know, broken out of their own echo chambers or etc. You know, as you said, I am also part of the DSI World Core team, so shameless plug, but we're super focused on building uh, and facilitating a community that serves as sort of a, a gateway to everything you need to participate in DSI. And we acknowledge that people are coming in from different backgrounds, from science natives to Web3 natives to people who are just interested and curious about either community. Um, and so we're hoping to leverage the community itself to build around its needs. And I think that's something that should be adopted in various DSI uh, projects and communities, if not already. Um, you know, to be more concrete, we're focusing on endeavors like resource and document translation as a really basic one, peer-to-peer um, -peer opportunities, uh, open community participation and quorum, um, just, you know, these endeavors are, of course, all with intention to foster participation from different backgrounds in science and in Web3. Yeah, those are really great points that you bring up. Um, I think in particular, the asynchronous communication, um, how it's, it's socially acceptable to coordinate scientific endeavors now using Discord or other messaging apps. Um, whereas traditionally in academia, we're used to having meetings in person pre-pandemic and over Zoom, at least during the pandemic, everything just sort of shifted to online, but remained otherwise the same. In fact, I think we have a lot of more meetings now somehow yeah. since people discovered <laughs> Zoom. And so I think it's important for people building for the global community to keep in mind that if all of your events are on Eurocentric and America-centric time zones, that you might be reinforcing the your you know this kind of Eurocentric, America-centric narrative that exists in traditional science. And it might make more sense to 
try to build tools to keep everyone engaged as asynchronously as possible, where possible, or, you know, develop other methods to mitigate time zone issues, like having, you know, the same event staggered across a few time zones, making liberal use of recordings and having liaisons, cross time zone liaisons. So I think those are really important points to bring up. Um, I want to talk a little bit now that we've discussed how to reach a global community um, and Talissa brought up some excellent points about having um, resources available in native languages and recognizing people coming from different cultures. So now let's say that we have sent out information in an accessible language in an accessible format you know, is that enough? Let's move on to Kendall here. Is that enough just, you know, the existing literature, you speak English and you're on our time zone and you have, um, you know, seen some materials that have come out explaining what decentralized science is. Is that enough to get you excited about it? Um, you know, what do you think is necessary after the phase of like getting reached with the information? What is necessary to move from, I've heard of this to I'm participating in this? Yeah, thanks um, for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to speak. Um, I would say initial reaching is an important step, of course, in um, garnering interest from a large audience, but there should be an emphasis on maintaining opportunities for engagement for people at multiple levels. Um, so considering the um, accessibility of the platforms being used, um, if you're talking about from a cryptocurrency financial perspective, um, are there going to be investments required meeting people where they are in terms of price point? And um, really thinking about, especially for scientists, I think this community and this intellectual engagement piece. So identifying strengths that, um, as a, I'm speaking as a scientist, so um, identifying strengths that scientists could bring to the table, what perspectives you can offer. Um, so I'm not someone who has a, um, a building background or a software engineering background, but I really am enthusiastic about how can we leverage blockchain technologies to, um, to sort of push the boundaries of science and what we're capable of doing. So I think that's very important is to identify um, once you have a cohort of people, what are the strengths and what are projects that people like me could, could get engaged in. Yeah, and so speaking of you specifically, just even though it's an N of one, you as a scientist, what really clicked for you? Like what made you feel more interested in this space and stopped you from continuing to scroll to something else? What was important to you? Yeah, so really feeling that um, starting out my um, participation, my perspective was going to be valued. Um, so initially I had um, sort of run into uh, on Twitter, different accounts related to blockchain technologies, different DAOs, all of these are very new concepts for me. Um, and so this also speaks, I think, to the importance of the network effect. So thinking about who are you connected with? Um, and I just so happened as your classmate to be connected to you on Twitter um, and also following the Web3 Women in Science account. And so that was an important gateway. And I think this is, there are um, positions for organizations to um, sort of collect people with common interests and help facilitate them in terms of here's a direction um, that you might want to pursue in terms of how can you apply your science background. And so then I became sort of a, a moderator on um, the Web3 Women in Science Discord. So joining all these different Discord communities. Um, so that was sort of my initial entree. And what kept me here really is the not only the potential of the blockchain technologies to be um, applied to specific scientific concepts, but the possibility of um, holding people accountable, not only in terms of the quality of the research that's being addressed. So how can we use, for example, a token system um, to reward people for putting in that time and effort that it takes to review a publication, which we all know takes, well, if you're in science, you know that a quality peer review takes a lot of time. Um, so that's one metric of accountability that I think the space can offer, but also the accountability to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So how do we build from the ground up a community that reaches um, uh, uh, people from all different backgrounds, experiences, um, and global communities? So I think what I'm hearing you say is that some of the failings in the traditional scientific institutions with accountability, both in 
research conduct or misconduct, as has been in the news a lot lately, um, and in issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion made you feel like you wanted to explore potential new paradigms, and then that brought you here. And then you also mentioned the network effect, and I just want to pull on that thread for one second before we move on to um, ask Aaron some questions about engagement. So. Can you define for us what you feel is the network effect and then why it might be important? Yes, when I think about the network effect, I think about the tendency of a field to sort of push in the direction of the interests of a homogenous group of people who tend to be leading that field. And that is in large part um, determined by this network connectivity of the people who are advancing that particular field. And so that's important when we're thinking about building a DSI space because the people who are connected to each other and are then setting the agenda of a particular organization, we should be very conscious about who we um, sort of bring, whose perspectives we bring as we make um, organizing, organizationally defining decisions. Yes, excellent. And so it was important to you to have somebody you felt you could relate to in the space. Um, was it important to have like a one-on-one -on -one buddy or do you think just having people in general in the space that you could relate to that you saw yourself in, was that the most important thing or are they both important? Both are important for different reasons. So the concept of someone who looks and looks like me has similar background and experiences me as me is one thing, but also just the one-on-one -on -one buddy situation. I mean, I think about the first time that Arielle and I were sitting in a bar and she, um, you know, mentioned the Surge Women token was about to be minted. And so I minted an NFT in a bar for the first time. And so that one-on-one -on -one, um, connection is also a buddy system, I think would be helpful as well. Well, we'll do what we can to create enough buddy systems in Web3 Women in Science to get more of us. And hopefully, I love that I was able to recruit you being in my class, but hopefully together we'll come up with methods to extend that beyond just our immediate classmates. And I'm really looking forward to using university networks to do that. Erin, um, really happy to have you here today and talk with you. Um, I feel that you are far more of an expert than me on this. You've been in this space for so long and are such a, a, a big name in community management and um, you know, tech entrepreneurship. And I would just love to hear open-ended your thoughts on what it takes once people join an organization to keep them happy, engaged, coming back and contributing in a meaningful way. Absolutely. So I think just building off of what Tlissa and Kendall have said so far, um, there's a huge opportunity here, especially in the DSI space, to really disrupt, in a sense, some of the different scientific systems and ways that the scientific community has operated, basically, since the beginning of time. And um, that can create different pathways for people to engage in those opportunities that may not have had the opportunity or invitation to do so at that level. Um, with that, by when creating those different pathways, really meeting people where they're at is an essential component. And that's tying into, okay, what is already existing currently? How can that be expanded or altered a teeny bit to then create um, just more invitation, more openness, more opportunities for feeling like somebody is allowed or belongs within some of these spaces. And some of these shifts don't have to be massive. Um, a lot of it is little tweaks. Obviously, some massive shifts um, could support as well, but it can be as simple as meeting people where they're at. Let's say somebody's coming from a traditional scientific background, maybe in academia, just understanding that that's their foundation and then creating a better flow for, okay, you're used to operating in this type of way, maybe with these types of hierarchies or interacting with other labs in this manner. Now you have the opportunity to really claim the space that you want to claim and pursue the research you're interested in through some of these DSI labs um, and different communities that exist. Um, and so I think that 
really meeting people where they're at is the underlying kind of foundation to being able to create better onboarding pathways and ultimately belonging. Do you have any particular examples you've noticed through your studies of DAOs um, and in particular science DAOs of any best practices or mistakes that are made? You know, any concrete examples of either these minor or major shifts that need to, that, you know, may need to happen to have a more diverse, equitable and inclusive space? Absolutely. I think one um, glaring platform kind of at the intersection of some of these challenges is discord like it's a fantastic way to communicate to connect to create different guilds or different projects and just have those teams be able to meet effectively however if somebody is downloading discord for the very first time they get thrown in here and they might have come across the dower the organization that owns that discord um, they might have no further context beyond that. One, navigating the space, and two, understanding what's that first step of how I should actually contribute or get involved. So really providing a little bit more context as to what somebody is stepping into when entering some of these different technologies, whether it's Discord, whether it's creating a wallet for the first time, and what that looks like or why that matters. That's obviously expanded beyond the DSI space as well, but I think DSI is kind of uniquely positioned in the sense that a lot of folks that might be coming in um, may not have a purely technological background, whereas other DAOs might attract more people that have that technological background and might have just more exposure to some of these technologies previously. Whereas in this space, um, a little bit more support and guidance along the way could do wonders. So even perhaps on the website, you know, mm -hmm. where near the button where it says join Discord, maybe instead having like a two separate buttons that's like first time on Discord, click this first. And then, you know, describing in documentation what's going to happen, what you need to do first so that you don't get blocked by the verification bots for being too new. Um, so do you feel, so like, you know, just having more extensive documentation acknowledging that people coming in might be using things like Discord for the first time. Do you think that's enough? Or do you think that this, there's something inherently non-ideal about Discord that we'll have to face at some point? Um, I think how DAOs and communities are engaging with Discord is continuing to be discovered and explored. So I don't know if there's inherently a flaw with different technologies, but rather in how it's being used and for what communities it serves. Um, with that said, if there are other platforms that scientists are used to communicating and convening on, maybe that's actually where DSI should live or maybe a platform that resembles the spaces that they're used to operating in. Going back to your point about kind of having that context on the website, I think also positioning some of that context in different types of ways for each person's preferences. So some people prefer video, other people prefer an onboarding call, other folks just wanna read through a quick like white paper and then they're good to go, they can dive in. Um, and as we're looking at the Web3 space in general, it's very oriented towards the people who feel and have the psychological safety to jump into projects and really claim like, oh, I'm going to go make this new initiative happen. And through just how traditional science has pushed down certain types of people, some folks may not have as much of a foundation to feel they can jump in to that type of level. Um, so just recognizing different onboarding approaches for different types of scientists as well. That's excellent. And it looks like we do have a couple questions in the chat, um, you know, in the last two minutes or so. And I think, I think, Aaron, I think we can just keep going because I think you, um, I think that this is a question I would like to ask you. So this is a question from Shady say, Shady saying, how can we improve on existing scientific training and mentorship programs with distributed research networks and using Web3 technology? So I think this basically means 
Um, you know, what do you think DSI can do in the context of scientific training and mentorship specifically? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, just due to the decentralized nature of DSI, um, different early career scientists can have the opportunity to engage with mentors or other training opportunities that on a global scale. Whereas before, all of those different labs and opportunities um, weren't quite as connected. So I think there's a massive opportunity for that to happen here. Right. And that goes back to what Talissa was saying about the beauty of, you know, asynchronous global communication. And I think as technology progresses, I mean, we already have translation technologies um, you know, for a lot of languages where you can send a message in your language and it gets received by the other person in another language. So there's a lot of potential here. Um, all right. I think it's time to wrap up. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And I would like to uh, just leave everyone with the message that if you are interested in what Web3 Women in Science is trying to do with bringing more diversity, especially gender diversity, um, to the DSI space, anyone is welcome to join our server, our telegram, our events. Um, this is not a women only group. Um, if you are, we, some of our most avid contributors are men who just really believe in the mission of uh, recruiting my, a more diverse population to DSI. Um, so please feel free to come in. Um, please feel free to talk about your organization if you're interested in recruiting more women to your organization. Um, and uh, thank you again, Research Hub, for having us. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a great chat. Um, so up next, we have Adam Draper. Uh, Adam is a founder and managing director of Boost VC. He's a two-time entrepreneur and fourth generation VC, deals with some of the wildest sci-fi tech concepts, exoskeletons, backpacks, rockets. He co-founded Boost uh, after his success as an angel investor in companies like Coinbase, Amplitude, and PlanGrid. And he can also drink an entire bottle of Tabasco in 43 seconds. So a <laughs> man of many talents. Um, also, just one other thing I wanted to throw in here is Adam is maybe the first institutional investor who's really been like carrying the torch for DSI. Um, he's put together like a DSI focused podcast series, and I think has done a really good job of helping to draw some attention from other institutional players um, in the Web3 space. So Adam, it's great to have you. Excited for your talk here. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Patrick. And uh, that was a huge compliment on the, the DSI uh, torch bearing. Um, one of the reasons I've gotten so excited about this space in general is that it's, I keep telling people it smells a lot like early Bitcoin, and I'm sure that's been cited a few times. Uh, it's a lot of very, very passionate, uh, people who are all trying to solve incredibly difficult problems. And like, and it's also time for uh, a larger competitive science change over the span of time. So I'm, I'm really excited. So thank you for having me. Okay, so I, originally this was going to be called the failure of VC in science, uh, which I do believe is a really interesting topic. But as I started to think about why I'm so excited about this space, I wanted to, and as an institutional investor and uh, as an investor who's been in the sort of crypto and uh, and well, Bitcoin, crypto space for about a decade now. Uh, I, I wanted to sort of give an overview of how I'm thinking about it, why I'm so excited about it, and why it, uh, it's going to be a seismic change, um, and uh, then how to participate. I was just sort of thinking if there are any institutional investors or any investors uh, on here, it might be interesting to just, or talent on here who's just curious. Uh, and then listen to my podcast. I'm dropping the first episode, which is with DSI Labs uh, on Monday, I think, Tuesday. Uh, and I've, I've recorded, I think, six episodes. Uh, that is, it's a 10, it's going to be a 10 episode series on the Boost VC podcast uh, that's all focused on just DSI. So I'm really excited uh, about this space but holistically. It's going to be super fun to track over the next decade. Um, and I think it's the best place that I could be spending my time. Um, okay, so a little bit about me. Uh, my, my name is Adam Draper. I'm the founder and managing director of Boost VC. We've invested in something like 350 startups. I've invested co collectively across 400. Uh, some of my earliest investments were things like Coinbase. Uh, and what 
at one point, I mean, when I met Brian Armstrong, uh, who was very excited about this space as well, obviously from his chat a couple of days ago, um, he said at some point the world's going to be on one financial infrastructure. And uh, he said, we're going to be the easiest way to buy a Bitcoin. And that was sort of my trip down the rabbit hole in that and through through uh, through the cryptocurrency rabbit hole, as we call it. Um, I started to really think about recently, I started to think about why, why Bitcoin was such an innovation. And the thing that I stumbled across was that there, the, what we're losing is trust in institutions as a society. And so I started to really brainstorm about other institutional trusts that might be being lost. And I realized that there was this emerging industry of scientists who were rebelling against the system. And so that, that was incredibly exciting to find out uh, in the same capacity that uh, Bitcoin was really a revolution that it created a competitive space to bring financial products. It's not, I don't necessarily think of it as finance versus the crypto space, I think of it, them working hand in hand so that they both get better. I think we are we need institutions actually to, to grow industries. Um, and I think the same thing's happening with academia and publishing. We, we needed a competitive space for this stuff to happen. Uh, so I'm not an official scientist, uh, but excited about DSI. And the one thing that has been consistent across my entire uh, career is that I'm just obsessed with early stage breakthroughs and the communities that form around them. Uh, I, a little bit, bit, bit about me, I love comic books. Uh, I have an enormous collection. My favorite comic book is a comic called Invincible, uh, that it was created uh, by a guy named Robert Kirkman. Uh, and I was raised on Monopoly. Um, so I did, but I am going to bring up some of these things throughout the, the whole thing. Not Monopoly, actually. I just wanted to say it because Monopoly is awesome. I, I play any board game. I should just say board game. Um, so why I'm here? I'm going to be investing very heavily in DSI. Uh, we're, we're in the process of sort of allocating our first couple checks right now. Uh, it reminds me a lot of early Bitcoin. And it's time that we have an alternative space to compete, to create a competitive space uh, for science against uh, classic academia and publishing. Uh, I know that tons of people have been talking about the misincentive structures of uh, current academia or current academia and publishing for science um, and really uh, I'm, I'm excited to have a role in this new community that's being built out. Uh, so boost, a quick thing on Boost VC, uh, our mission is to accelerate the sci-fi future. Uh, we've been doing this for 10 years, we've invested in about 350 startups and uh, we believe that sci-fi tech startups uh, of today Will become the most iconic companies of tomorrow and it's because they do you can think of things like uh spacex is the uh in battling the institution of boeing uh you can think of tesla was a ridiculous idea uh, an electric car 19 years ago was a ridiculous idea um martin eberhard was actually the inventor of that which i want to i'm going to probably bring up later and there's just it, Basically, if you are experimenting on the, uh, the tip of the spear in, in uh, sci-fi or in technologies, those companies always end up changing how the world functions. And I was able to see this from the ground up with Bitcoin, the Bitcoin ecosystem. And uh, it's, yeah, I, that was a very special thing for me to be able to watch. Um, so we finance rebellions against legacy institutions. Again, exactly why, why we're, we're focused here. And the size check we write is $500,000. So if you're an entrepreneur uh, and you're interested in potentially uh, building something uh, in what DSI or science or whatever it might be, we love taking on difficult challenges. We love uh, mission-driven founders and we love to support ecosystems. Um, also, just talk to our founders. Like I, I think, generally, holistically, people enjoy our our company. I, I'm seeking partnership and friendship. Uh, so one of the things, and so I wanted to title this "Competitive Science" because I think that's really what this is about. We're suddenly, we're moving from a institutionally controlled scientific method, 
and we are evolving to a global talent pool uh, community. And we, we have seen that ha transition happen with DeFi and how ownership on the internet has changed the world. Uh, that is what is taking place in Discord servers everywhere in the decentralization of science. Um, and so it's institutions versus DeSci. Uh, why DSI? So something that I've been uh, on these podcasts that I've been recording every single time, what I start with is what is science? I think there's a really interesting thing. And, I, I, you know, I'm obviously not a, not a scientist, uh, but the one thing I remember from seventh grade science is that it was a process. And the, the really fascinating thing that I, I feel is really important for people to always remember is that it's the process in pursuit of knowledge. It's not a fact. It's not, uh, it is the pursuit of truth. It is the process and pursuit of truth. And that is the thing that I ask, as I've started most of these episodes of the podcast with, because everyone has a sort of more personal uh, definition to themselves of what science is. But the one common theme is that it was about, it's a process. And um, I think that D side gives a, uh, a space for a competitive process that is not controlled by any uh, specific institution. And why does this matter? I mean, you're all bought, most of you are probably bought in already or you're trying to learn more about uh, this, this space. The, the question that I always ask with Bitcoin, um, you know, people, people have their heels stuck in the ground when there's new technologies involved. They, uh, like I remember talking to my grandfather um, who I love dearly and I still have breakfast with every two weeks. But I was, uh, I, was, I, I was going all in on Bitcoin and we were the first fund to ever go all in on Bitcoin. And I said, I'm going all in on Bitcoin. He said, there is no possible way that this works. Um, there, you need a government to create a currency. You need it, like people forget, it's only been a decade, but like the mind shift that's happened where you could have a currency online globally is crazy. Like that the mind shift changed a lot. And my grandfather was like, there's no way that this works. That's sort of what a lot of the people here are going to be met with. A lot of the people who are building in this space are going to be met with the challenge of what, uh, why you're spending your time in DSI. And the hard part's not when you get to argue about it. The hard part's when it gets dismissive, when people say, is that thing still a thing? Like, are we, is there really still a competitive space for this? Um, and that, you know, in 2014, 2015, I would say that that was when that happened. Um, so, the legacy financial institution, I think, is analogous to the uh, scientific publishing institutions. Um, and we are dealing with a very controlled system uh, that where the skewed incentives are for being published rather than creating breakthroughs. And I think at the base of that is a very exciting thing. Uh, DSI is controlled by everyone. I also think one of the coolest parts of it uh, that I will get into and uh, define a little further is that. Uh, I believe it's going to flip the script on who gets uh, compensated. And that's one of the most exciting parts of this as well, uh, is that inventors, you could be an inventor and be one of the wealthiest people on the planet. Uh, that, that is a transition that is going to be happening. You can be an inventor, a scientist. You can be um, the, the person. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. Um, so the key, the, one of the things I wanted to really distill down on during this presentation was uh, scientific advancement. One of the things that why it matters is that it advances history. In 12, this is, and I'm, do, I'm doing a quick history lesson and I, of things that I thought were really, really interesting scientific pieces of progress over the last, you know, 2000 years, obviously. Uh, but in 1206, uh, Genghis Khan um, was able to merge a bunch of nomadic tribes uh, into the largest nation. Now, this might not sound like a scientific advancement, but the reason he was able to do this, one of the key reasons that uh, or what, ever, anytime you read about this, they will bring up, is that uh, they, they had a lot of um, armor was very heavy and big. And the Mongolians, they would actually use very light armor and then they would wear a silk shirt underneath that armor because the weapon of choice was shooting arrows at that time, uh, one of the weapons of choice. And normally you might die of infection, you might die because the arrow goes through your body. And what silk does, it, it wouldn't, you couldn't, the arrow would rarely penetrate the silk. So you're able to actually get it out of your body. Now, 
the thing about Genghis Khan, though, is that you, he got all the credit for this, but there's some person who realized that silk was basically impenetrable by arrows and which changed dictated the terms of war. And so the value was actually accrued by Mongolia, but Genghis Khan in this capacity. Uh, here in the late, it, okay, now this is another trivia question. So just to keep you engaged in this process, this thought process around sort of scientific innovation. Uh, in the late 1800s, uh, someone invented the combustion engine. Do you know who that was? Because I didn't. <laughs> uh, it's a guy named Etienne Lenore. Uh, and some of you probably were like, yeah, I'm a trivia master and we're able to come up with Etienne Lenore. But Etienne Lenore didn't capture all the value. This was the true scientist who created the combustion engine. Without the combustion engine, uh, no Henry Ford, no car companies, no John D. Rockefeller. Not to say I do see scientific uh, progress sort of happening in tandem, and I'm sure someone else was working on a similar combustion engine, something to compete with the horse. But we don't remember him, but we do remember John D. Rockefeller, and we do remember Henry Ford, because they were good at the commercialization. They were good at bringing this to the masses. And they were good at accruing the value. Um, in 1973, this is bringing us closer to today, two people started the development of the TCP IP. So they created the internet. The reason that we are able to communicate right now uh, through the internet is because of these two people. And do you know who those people were? This is a hard thing to do with like no feedback loop right now. Here, wait one second. Oh, there's like a QA thing over here. Okay. Um, oh, okay, good. There's questions being, geez, I don't have a, um, oh shoot. Sorry, one second, I gotta, I can't find the, okay, got it. Their name were Robert Kahn and Vint Cerf. I didn't know that either. Uh, but can you imagine, without the internet, we don't have Zoom, but we also don't have Fang, a bunch of trillion dollar, multiple trillion dollar companies were created based off of computer scientists who were financed by the government. Um, and so also, if you think about all of these advancements, each of these, uh, generally government financed. And most advancements in history were government financed. Um, and then, but the commercialization was privatized. I think that DSI is a chance for us to uh, like blend the two financial models. Um, so without this innovation, no global connectivity, which no Bitcoin, no anything these two guys we should have a holiday in the united states for these two two guys but like i would say most people aren't aren't celebrating robert Kahn and vint surf all that often so i think we should celebrate them today you should think about that at the dinner table today just be like thank you for this and when you're typing on the discord servers these two uh okay but we do remember Carnegie, we remember Rockefeller, we remember Ford, Getty. I, I, I didn't remember Tutsumi, but a, a real estate investor. Uh, Bill Gates, Carlos Swim, uh, Slim, Bezos, and Musk. And we remember them because they were the commercializers. They were able to take a scientific advancement and they were able to find the application that actually saved humans time. Now, I don't know if the what the value chain of what something should be valued at at the very, very beginning and what the commercializers should be able to get. But I do believe that uh, the people who create the breakthrough should be compensated in some form or another. Uh, and I, up until today, huge scientific discoveries that has not been true. Sometimes these the scientists are able to get on a board. Sometimes, it, you know, they get tenure, they do all this stuff, but like, they're not Elon Musk. We don't celebrate them like Elon Musk. And so I think that over the next decade, that is the transition DSI is fighting for. We're fighting for the wealthiest person on the planet to be a scientist. Um, we overvalue commercialization and we undervalue the breakthrough. And so this is the current state of the world. The current state of the world is break, breakthrough at the top. 
and there's the dollar amount, and then there's this sort of commercialization process. And whoever figures out how to achieve mass market commercialization, they get the money. I believe that DSI is changing the script on the protocol, just like there's this great, uh, if you want to read something really interesting today, there's something called, I think it was jo uh, Joel Monegro, he wrote a uh, fat protocols thesis for crypto, uh, where the value gets accrued on the protocol level rather than the application layer. I believe that this is that, but for atoms, where, where he's talking about bits. Um, and so that, not atoms like my name, but atoms. Uh, so we're, we're evening out the spectrum of where the value in the thread is, because we do have mass distribution now through the internet. We do have mass communication. A lot of the value should be about the breakthrough and what's been th throttling breakthroughs are academia and publishing. So creating an alternative space is probably the most important thing that we could do um, to be able to create this global talent pool and tap into this global talent pool to create breakthroughs. The thing that drives me nuts is when breakthroughs are being stifled by regulation or other institutions. It's like it's like nails on the chalkboard, you know, like um, that, hopefully that's helpful. Uh, OK. One of the reasons that this matters to me also, I just wanted to bring up in a uh, more well, lighthearted way is, well, lighthearted, I don't know, um, is that I was promised superpowers. Science promised superpowers, right? Like if you think about it, Iron Man being able to fly individually, uh, Amazing Spider-Man got bit by a radioactive spider, uh, and the X-Men, uh, by the way, I know too much about the history of comic books, but basically uh, when Stan Lee, Stan Lee got bored of the, like, everyone gets a superpower through radioactivity. Like if you list off a lot of the people who got superpowers, it was like, they're, they're like a couple forms. There's gods, there's uh, people who got like radioactively done, and then there's the people who are biologically born with a mutant gene. And like, so he created this new idea of biology, biological mutant genes, um, which, you know, CRISPR is probably going to be able to deliver to us someday. Without Marie Curie, we wouldn't have radioactive comic book superheroes. Uh, Marie Curie was, it was like 1903, where they, she had all this, with these breakthroughs on radioactive elements. Um, okay, so ingenuity, radioactive genetics, like these are three different breakthroughs throughout history. People trivialize what comic books actually are, which they they actually become mass market because they they deliver a core character who's at the soul of a society at the time. Uh, Iron Man, Stan Lee actually created. This is a little off topic, but I think it might, you might remember a little more of this presentation if I give you this. Um, at the time, it was the Vietnam War. Everyone hated warmongers, so he created a character. Uh, who was a uh, who was a defense contractor, who billionaire. No one liked rich people or war, and so he created a defense contractor billionaire who was able to build things. And like it was the most popular comic for a very very long time. Um, the, 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 I, I won't give in, go into the history of all of these, but, but it's fun if you want to talk about that later. Um, yeah, and so without different uh, pieces. Without these different, like in 1969 and 1943 and 1953, we had huge scientific advancements. We had, uh, we, we got to space, we get to, the, we go to the moon, um, Marie Curie and, and Einstein with Manhattan Project. So we go from radioactive elements to like the Manhattan Project, which actually built a nuclear bomb. Uh, and thus we have all these radioactive like superhero characters. And then uh, I used Watson Crick modeling of the DNA as a big piece of this. So um, for, for, and that, that was a big piece of biology, which brought about X-Men. Um, so I believe that over the next, uh, wait, where's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, so my belief is that over the next decade, three of the wealthiest people are going to be a scientist, a teacher, and an artist. And uh, these are these these. Uh, it is because of the collapse of institutional trust and building these alternative spaces that these uh, these careers get to target new financial incentive structures 
Uh, and so I believe that the, the, and if you think about it, this transition is starting to happen. You could, you could claim Bill Gates is a computer scientist. You could say Elon Musk is a scientist of some kind, but I actually believe that what's going to happen on this spectrum where at the, at the top, there's a breakthrough and at the bottom there's commercialization, you're going to be able to cash and make money at each point of it for the commercialization rather than just making money when you're selling to humans, because there's a free market for all this stuff. Um, it's going to be, a, it's a very, very exciting way to incentivize breakthroughs. Uh, and okay, again, uh, hopefully you understand why I'm excited about this. Uh, how, how to participate. Uh, you want to meet, you want to meet with the way to participate is join all the discord servers, talk to all the people who are really building these, uh, companies and projects inside of the, the ecosystem, uh, get hired by them. The other way to, there are projects you can buy tokens that you can invest in the companies. There's, a, or just start to like finance people to research this, like research some science. So I think that's a very, very exciting way to do it. And then the last thing is listen to my podcast. It's where I'm exploring with, you know, you know DSI Labs and Molecule and Research Hub. And we explore why DSI, why is this going to change the world? Um, thank you for listening to my presentation here I'll, I'll stop the share uh and we'll here, I'll go to awesome. uh and i'll answer some questions i guess uh i see a question that's why i was going to ask uh what are the main characteristics of an investable d size startup project so uh, Daniel, thank you for asking. Um, so I always think this, it's the same amalgamation of a company or a project. It's you need people who are uh, and the success is determined by commitment. I have seen success uh, be determined by commitment throughout my entire career. Um, you either need a mission where people are committed to the mission or a group of people who are committed to the partnership of people who they're with. And that's why crypto was so powerful was most people were really, really talented and they were committed to each other and the mission. And so I think that these collectives of, uh, of DAOs or companies or whatever you want to call it, all these things are just organisms in order to get the best people possible to solve the hardest problems, right? Like who cares if it's a company, who cares if it's a project, it's the way in which you're incentivizing people to grow and solve that problem. And so that's that's what at the core of Boost VC, what we've always thought is like, it doesn't it doesn't matter as long as you're making progress, whether it's a company or a project. And sometimes you have to start as one and become the other, or become the other and start as one. You know, like you have to figure out what your path is um, for the right reasons. You don't just launch a token to launch a token. You don't just you like you need to create the you need to be on your own mission. Um, I hope that helps. I, I think that it always starts with a few committed individuals who believe in their partner or the mission, ideally both. Um, what are Boost's goals when investing in DSI? How do you uh, balance public goods with business models? Um, look, at the end of the day, I am uh, like you, you, if you would, Beza, I'm, I'm a capitalist, okay? Like, and it's it's the best, it's the worst ideology except for all the other ones, right? Like capitalism is the best way to take care of your neighbor um, by creating mixed incentive systems, uh, well-designed incentive structures. Um, and so this question is really around how do you uh, get around public good versus, and this is the core problem that I think is being solved by DSI. I believe public goods become the way that you can invest in breakthroughs and you can actually have incentives alignment and make money off of it. Um, and that's sort of the really, really exciting part of this movement to me uh, is that it's a, it's a global experiment, experimental talent pool trying to create breakthroughs uh, outside of academia. And I believe that there's going to be some structure like the LLC or the C Corp in the, the United States that globally will be accepted as a tokenized DAO uh, that will align incentives and grow value. Um, it's, it's, 
you it's still an experiment and you have to think of it that way you can't think of it as you have to think hey i think this is the best way to raise money and align incentives for me to solve the problem i'm trying to solve um and so that that continues to be true um amazing spec, uh, specification about breakthroughs and regulations yeah Dude, uh, yeah reg, reg, i mean i've I started my first company I ever started was a company called Expert Financial. It was a secondary market for private securities. Um, and when when it, after four and a half years, we failed, but I learned a ton. And like I, I learned about people. I learned how to make progress. I learned a ton of stuff where that I was able to use to help other founders start. And in my head, I was like, I am I, I let my series seven and 63 expire which are the regulatory like permits for you to actually like function as a broker. And I let them expire because I was like, I don't want to ever work in regulation. It regulated markets again. First market I get into crypto. <laughs> so, so that's been, that's been fun. Um, and then do we need governments to enforce the commercialization of science to pay back a percentage of their industry through sciences? <clears throat> Look, the, how do I say this the best? Um, this is a really interesting question, is what I'll, uh, I'll start with. Um, I believe that government is the other uh, trusted institution that's lo losing trust at a fast rate right now. Uh, and I believe uh, we have this if you want to read a really, really great book, read uh, The Network State by Balaji. Um, and uh, he, he's sort of talking about how geographic geography doesn't matter anymore, right? Um, because we're all, we, we all relate to each other. We have the internet. We can communicate with each other. And it's really about an exchange of goods and services. Um, and my, I, I don't like the idea of government enforcing anything is my answer because in a good capitalistic community uh you figure out what the uh guardrails are based off of the market and it's based off of buy and sell um and whether or not there's an actual need for the product and i i think that my issue my issue with the government like enforcing it uh is more about like it would slow down the progress of the breakthroughs, which it, my real goal is just to create this competitive space that's really in the globe, not inside of a specific jurisdiction. Like right now, there, there are people who take boats off of uh, like hospital boats into international waters to get surgeries just because they're not allowed to in, in the US and it, it, because it hasn't gone through FDA trials or whatever. Like, these these experiments are already happening and we're not letting them happen so but we're not allowing like innovation to take place even if people want it um so i that that's sort of like i would love for i see what the intent of the question is my real goal is i see this i think nfts enabled creators in a way that hadn't been possible before uh nfts are going to enable people in in science the same way, where it's really about intellectual property and showing the beginning. All we got with crypto was uh, like replacing uh, replacing trust with mathematical proof. And so you can prove you have one thing, right? And then you have a history of that one thing. And so that's what we're getting. We're gonna have a huge history of all this different scientific IP where you're able to track from the beginning. And so every person who contributed along the way will get compensated. And that's exciting. So yeah, in my mind, it's very similar to the crypto movement. Um, but the thing that's different is you do work with atoms more in science than bits, where everything about, uh, and, and there is, when you move from bits to atoms, there's always regulatory change that you have to deal with. And that's been really, really difficult for all NFT projects who are trying to own real estate, all NFT projects who are trying to own art, like in the real world. And so I think science is going to have to solve a couple of those problems. But good questions. Wow.
Cool. So I think that pretty much wraps up the question. Thank you, Adam, for the presentation, for uh, taking all those questions. Totally agree that if scientists can capture a little bit more of the value they create, you know, we'll start to get a little bit more celebrity around these people who are like creating new knowledge and maybe even encourage like new people to look into science as a potential career. So yeah, thanks again. It was great to have you. Ah, it was awesome. Thanks for having me. Um, so up next, uh, we have the CEO and co-founder from DSI Labs, Christopher Hill, uh, speaking about open verifiability. Oh, awesome. Chris is the best. Yeah. Yeah. Um, towards a more reproducible scientific record, which returns value to scientific communities, kind of what Adam was just talking about. So Chris, great to have you. Just a little background on Chris here. Uh, Chris is a co-founder of DSI Labs and an interdisciplinary scientist who's worked at the crossroads of neuroscience, economics, and machine learning. He has a PhD in neuroeconomics and a couple of cool papers uh, published in big journals. So Chris, great to have you here. Hey, great to be here. Um, yeah, super excited. Thanks a lot for uh, organizing all of this, um, Patrick. We've had some really great speakers up to now. So, so today I'm going to talk about open verifiability and how this could promote a more reproducible scientific record, which returns value to scientists. So the first thing I want to frame out is the broader problem beyond uh, funding of science, beyond uh, um, the questions of, of prestige in academia, but really go towards the, the threat that our epistemic commons, our information sphere is facing at the moment. They're under threat. Uh, trusted intermediaries used to play a critical role and still do today to some degree in curating uh, research and knowledge and you'd have that process typically ha be handled by a journal who would you know, uh, conduct peer review over multiple months at the behest of the authors. Then uh, that curation process would trickle up to the press, to journalists who would report about it. For example, in New York Times, it would then go up you know, to policymakers uh, um, who, for example, you know, people working at the Federal Reserves or, or others there. So there's, that's our in information supply chain, essentially. And um, it's not foolproof, right? There's been some spectacular failures of that information supply chains uh, over the years. And you know, we have, for example, right now, uh, the unraveling of the Alzheimer house of cards with the beta amyloid hypothesis and other uh, key papers that have been found you know, to contain uh, uh, image fabrication and other signs of fraud, which are calling into question you know, whole edifices of science. And these are you know, hundreds of millions of dollars that have been invested into that. Um, this trusted intermediary model has suffered from two major systemic failures. Um, the first one and the most important one is the replication crisis. There's a, uh, a raging replication crisis out there. Uh, papers simply don't replicate. Uh, John Ioannidis, you know, uh, wrote a famous paper, uh, Why Most Research Findings Are False. And there's essentially a, a lot of work to be done to improve the reproducibility of research uh, um, in general. Um, and the other uh, major issue is that the publishing industry has consolidated in a few publishers who have a monopoly on knowledge and exploit that monopoly with libraries and other funders and exploit scientists to work for free to essentially become you know, content creators for Elsevier. Nobody wants that anymore. So there's a rebellion that's brewing in academia. You can see this on Twitter. You can see this as a journal editor where it's getting harder and harder to find qualified peer reviewers because people are simply fed up with a lot of the system in its current incarnation. Um, and so what's the alternative? So there's a void. And the void that's happening right now is that there's a direct model that's becoming more and more common. Essentially, it goes from preprint platforms directly to social media, directly to a journalist who's interested in generating clicks over uh, sharing valid knowledge. And this is a this is a, a threat to our epistemic commons. You have that. Uh, you have spectacular cases, for example, the HIV gene insertion and that COVID preprint, right, which has been debunked. But the damage has been done, and there's still a lot of people out there believing that COVID does H has HIV inserts. Uh, uh, into, into its virus. Uh, so so the, these uh, information hazards tend to live in uh, conspiracy silos, tend to live. But as governments and institutions are losing trust, these conspiracy silos are growing and there's more and more people that are being radicalized to believe things that come forward to pre-existing ideas uh, that they might have, which might be flawed. And um, the question is, well, this is perhaps, you know, one of the greatest responsibility for DSI and one of the greatest hopes we have is 
can we create a system that addresses some of these pressive, pressing problems about the quality of our information spheres right now? And this one of this idea, one of these ideas that can be very powerful is this notion of open verifiability. Open verifiability is the idea that anyone can take a research object, a piece of public research that is accompanied by artifacts, and essentially add a validation grant. And by adding that val validation grant that would go, that would be earmarked to a scientific society with a certain reputation level, it would then start producing the, the uh, validation work, right? It would essentially be curating our epistemic comments at a high level and caring for things such as reproducibility. And simply today, this, uh, this absolutely does not exist. Uh, verification is done at the behest of scientists who submit their work to journals. So I wanna talk about a broader vision for DSI and how, what are the components that need to be in place so that we can create this, uh, uh, this ideal of open verifiability. Um, first of all, we need different models of storing and archiving uh, research papers and research artifacts. We need to move away from silos that are controlled by publishers or by a, an operating company that are essentially closed off repositories which might have access rules into a model where we have gateways right, gateways that are essentially cylinders where you can create a research object that gets indexed on a universal record that is uh, immutably open access. And our goal with the DSI infrastructure that we're building is how can we create a maximally robust, secure, and uh, fair, fair principles, fair knowledge graphs. Um, the second thing, and this is very important, if DSI is to gain scientific legitimacy in the scientific sphere, we need to come up with a better version of record. The version of record is essentially right now defined as the publisher published PDF, all right? That's the version of record. We need to move the version of record away from a simple manuscript that stands on its own towards a research objects with contained artifacts tied to that research, for example, data, for example, code, for example, a reproducible container, all or, or even like a, a results presentation, all of those objects need to be in the same place, aggregated in a decentralized repository, which cannot be closed off and, and put behind paywalls. Um, and we need to increase the certification scope. Right now, we're verifying manuscripts. We're not looking beyond manuscripts. Uh, we need to, to, to do peer review, conduct peer review, and conduct science expert high-level scientific validation on the entire object. We have to check if it's reproducible. We have to, to essentially verify its, um, its properties. Uh, and that's what we call attributes. Uh, we're gonna get back to that. Um, and verifiability today is closed, right? It's done at the behest of authors. I'm an author, I have a manuscript, I send it to nature and they'll come back with peer reviews, which are often closed. And I'm the only one essentially who has a lever on the, on the graph of knowledge where I can, I can elicit expert feedback, right? Uh, the, the other part of that is of course, post-publication peer review, but there's no way to incentivize you know, high quality post-publication peer review right now. Um, and so this idea uh, cannot work if we do not have a different model of value capture. And value capture right now is happening, is essentially entirely captured by the scientific publishers. As I do work as an editor or as a peer review as part of a journal, I'm doing that on a, on a pro bono basis, right? All the revenue that is generated from selling the work that goes into these journals or, or, or through APCs, author publishing costs, because as an author, you have to pay to publish. That's the model for open access. All of that value goes directly into the coffers of the publishers and scientists don't see any of it. And that's an incredibly unfair status quo. And the deal would go something, something like that. It's like, well, we could actually do high quality a scientific validation. We could check for reproducibility. We could go in depth. We could do a much better job but that's not gonna happen in the current model in which I feel like a content creator for Elsevier, and that's fair. So I wanna go zoom out a bit and take you know, a bit more of an academic mantle here. Um, what does it mean to be published? So we have all these anachronos anachronistic uh, uh, terms when, it, when, it, when we talk about scientific curation, right? We say we have preprints, preprints to understand it's not published, it's not peer reviewed. A published paper has a number of properties, right? So a published paper has a set of, attributed, uh, um, of attributes which have been verified by a trusted intermediary. And that's the certification function. Uh, one of them is, is it sound? Are the conclusions warranted given the, the, the results uh, and, and the methods conveyed? 
The other one is uh, impact predictions, right? And this is, you know, the, the much maligned, uh, is it novel enough for nature, right? And uh, are the conclusions important? So essentially you have an editor and peer reviewers and maybe an editorial board, they're all working to try to make a prediction if that particular piece of object that has been that has been decided as valid by peer reviewers has essentially a conclusion of a scope that is of broad interest enough to be featured in some of these top journals, which are essentially have a monopoly on scientific prestige and guide decisions of funders and massive grant allocations. Um, and there's of course the big elephant in the room, right? Nobody checks for, very, for reproducibility. Are the results reproducible with the artifacts provided? And there's one exception to this rule, and I think this is something people don't know. It's uh, the American Economic Association with its flagship journal, the American Economic Review, has an incredibly rigorous uh, uh, peer review system in which after uh, it has conducted peer review for soundness, for impact prediction, it then verifies for reproducibility. And that's, you know, that, that's not something that a lot of people know. And when you look at the academic uh, uh, um, uh, taxonomy of journals, you have journals that only verify for soundness, like PLOS. You have journals like, you know, the, the, the uh, Science Nature Cell, they'll verify, they'll, they'll, they'll essentially certify for soundness and impact and make a prediction on impact. And the American Economic Association, on top of all of this, will verify for reproducibility by asking authors, you know, to put on their, to send their code and their data and have a, a, a number of scientists working with them verifying that the results reproduce. So that's a level of uh, rigor that goes far beyond what we have in the, in, the, in the classic sphere of journals. And one of the reasons why the American Economic Association does that and not, let's say, an LGB journal is that the scientific society has retained its publishing arm and has therefore been investing in improving uh, at a cost, right? Things that go beyond uh, the PDF because there's only a business model for the PDF. Um, and of course, there are organizations outside the scope that have been doing badging systems, right? And these badging systems have been designed to essentially um, provide alternative markers of quality, right? You can think of those as alternative attributes. So for example, has the study been pre-registered? Um, you have the, this is from the Center of Open Science who have been pioneers, by the way, in, in, in creating these badging systems. Uh, it has been followed by the ACM, that's the Association for Computing Machinery. They have done badges, you know, have you shared your artifacts? Are your artifacts reproducible? So when you think about it, um, journals essentially convey attributes to pieces of published research. Now, can we unbundle the implicit and make it explicit? And I think that's one of the promising thing about DSI and alternative publishing system is that yes, we can do that. Um, we can essentially treat a research object as having a set of attributes that are verifiable and that are clearly indexed in a way which are tamper proof on a, on a, on a decentralized ledger. So the idea is that um, we unbundle these attributes. Uh, the authors can self-select them, right? And then you have research communities that verify them. Anyone can contest the presence of these attributes, add these validation grants, and essentially elicit uh, this high quality scientific validation on these attributes. And you have things you know, that go from uh, the work is simply compliant, right? This means you know, authors' identities have been verified, no plagiarism, all the really basic checks. But then you can have things, you know, is the data being shared? Yes, it's open data. If the data is restrained access, is there a path? where I can actually know how to access that data, which is very often something that's completely missing from studies that have that, do, that use sensitive data. Um, are the results reproducible, right? Can I run an executable container? Or can I run the code locally with the data set and re reproduce those results? Um, is, has it been peer reviewed? All of those core functions that have been previously bundled in journals in a way that has you know, extracted value from scientists can be decoupled and unbundled to create these rich research objects which have a plurality of attributes. Now, of course, you might say, well, there's never gonna be an attribute system to rule them all. And that's absolutely true. And that's why it's important that organization, you know, maybe Research Rub, SCURF, others out there uh, can issue their own attributes, right? So you'd, you'd go defining your attribute, you'd maintain it, you'd set permissions on who can actually verify it. You can create, we can create plural systems of attribute verification, which would allow us to improve the reproducibility and the trust placed into uh, uh, scientific results. 
Of course, to do this efficiently, we need a way to aggregate all of the research outputs. So we need a way to essentially combine a preprint repository with a generalist repository where we can take all of those components like you see on, on the side and essentially connect the front end of the paper with the back end, which are all of these artifacts uh, that are, that are uh, uh, stored on, on these decentralized repository. And by doing that, by creating that interface where you can see and verify all of this, we essentially facilitate a system for attribute verification, which can be crucial and important in how in, 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 in essentially improving uh, uh, our epistemic comments and our ability to appraise uh, scientific knowledge. And this could lead you know, to things like proof of reproducibility, which are incredibly valuable to funders. Right now, funders, they have no way of verifying whether a scientist that I fund with millions of dollars every year actually publishes reproducible research. There's no in this, in this tracking that. And that's one of the things where DSI can add tremendous value in that workflow. So let me, uh, I'm gonna shift to a little demo. All right, so you've seen that at uh, EF Amsterdam, we're now in alpha. So we're, we're testing uh, um, the, the interface. We're gonna be starting indexing to index on chain pretty soon uh, on testnet. So the idea here is you can take any PDF, right? You can take any PDF, you can submit it to DSI, you can start creating a research object. And once you've created the research object, there will be an embedding, right? Which is what you see up there, which is essentially an immutable link to, uh, uh, to the node ID. So to the, to the identifier of that research object, which is clickable and resolvable. And once you're into that interface, you can now directly interact with all of the components of that research object. So here it's a paper on SNARKs. Uh, you can, for example, very relevant to these types of papers is posting artifacts such as code, right? So you can start adding codes directly into your paper. Uh, you can add, you know, result presentation deck. You can add a video. You can do all sorts of aggregation to create a, a reproducible artifacts. And you can connect all of this together in a way that's very easy for scientists to use. Because I think, I mean, we're, we're strongly of the belief that this needs to be a 20 minute process. People need to have excellent UI for all of this. This is the only way we're gonna gain adoption. And essentially you can drag and drop code files. You can uh, uh, indicate where people can actually find the relevant uh, uh, raw materials to recreate the results that are presented inside here, right? You can annotate it freely. And what I wanna draw your attention to today is this idea of attributes, right? This open verifiability. So here, for example, we have attributes from the uh, ACM, things like, are the artifacts available? Right? And what is the status on this attribute that has been self-selected by author? Has it been verified? In this case, yes. And these attributes need to have a number of components to, to essentially verify that their conditions are met. We need to have a known issuer. There needs to be a versioning that's done on behalf of the issuer. There needs to be information about who's the certifying entity of the attribute. There needs to be uh, uh, proof that this attribute is warranted right, in some way. And by doing this aggregation model, on these DSI nodes where you can combine all of these objects, we can essentially create a system where it is legible and simple. Well, simple, it's still a lot of work, but it is possible to validate these attributes and to improve our epistemic comments and to improve the ability uh, to create reproducible science. Um, you can add validation grants. The idea is, for example, you, you, you say, hey, I wanna verify attributes. I would pick an arc. Uh, this is of course just demo. Uh, but essentially, the idea is that anyone can be able to mend those validation grants uh, to, to have them uh, picked or not, right? Because these are grants by scientific societies that would then be producing uh, the certification process, which journals have been doing up to now. And the system is complementary to the existing system. I think that's very important to stress is that, well, we can still have the journal system, you know, doing curation. And then we can have scientific societies that might be wanting to do reproducibility analysis, right? You might have scientific societies that do the whole thing. So this is a place where people and communities can start to experiment with the scope of the type of work that they engage in. Um, yeah, so essentially we don't wanna have a silo. We don't wanna be, hey, you have to go on dsi.com slash dsi node to use this platform. That's not the ethos of Web3. That's not the ethos of a decentralized system. That's why we're creating an open source stack where every community can run their own gateway, right? Every community can set up a DSI gateway, which is a deployable kit, which allows uh, scientists and members of their community to create these research objects and to index them on a DSI registry, 
Now, our goal is to create the most durable, verifiable, and fair knowledge graph possible, right? So that means we're mostly tech agnostic, uh, but we are using the existing tech stack that we're displaying here. Uh, so essentially we're creating the research object on a cloud interface. Then we use a IPLD to store that data model in a JSON LD compliant fashion. And we, in, we, we store that on the IPFS network through the work of those gateways, those community gateways, and we take the root hash of that using optimism, we index it on a DSI registry, which is an Ethereum smart contract, which essentially provides tamper-proofness regarding uh, that specific object. And more importantly, it provides immutable PID, persistent identifiers. Now everything in a DSI node can be cited. We can, every component of it has a persistent identifier that can be copied and cited anywhere and it's not at risk of link rot. It's cryptographically secured. But of course, the most important thing for all of this, regardless of the infrastructure we're building, regardless of these building blocks, is communities. And that's why we need to have, we need to have legit and, and, and high quality scientific communities uh, ready to take the risk of, of, of working and, and, and essentially, you know, flying from their own wings and having that experience of, of recapturing the value that they create by curating science. Um, and this is, you know, there's a lot of concepts floating around that. We're thinking about how can we make these communities inspiring? How can we facilitate the community coordination that is involved around verifying these research objects? And this community layer, we're not there yet, but we're working on it. And it's something that's, that's gonna be very important for uh, uh, um, essentially curating uh, these objects. And we can imagine these communities as uh, collecting and curating a collection of featured work, right? These are the nodes of the, the research objects that the community feels most proud of, that means the most to them, and that exemplifies the type of work that they are capable of. And we're super excited for this future. Right now, there's many terms. There's ARCs, Autonomous Research Communities, DRC, Decentralized Research Centers, Research Hubs. And I think, you know, one of the very exciting concepts that has been appearing uh, in past months is the concept of DSOC, Decentralized Society, which is a blueprint on how we can scale and we can create these communities that uh, essentially create these plural network goods while tracking reputation and identities of their members. And science is a perfect experimental ground for that because scientists need to show to the world what they're capable of. And we need to, 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 to enable that in a way that is better than what has been done before. And so these are really some of our, of our dreams and aspirations for the future of DSI. And um, yeah, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, Alpha is live. We're testing on notes.dsi.com. Thank you to my wonderful team who has been growing and it's just uh, uh, been a blast working with everybody. So yeah, re happy to take questions. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, that was a great presentation. Really exciting vision. Uh, excited to see where your output goes. Uh, so we have a couple questions here in the next three minutes from Shadi and I'll break them down into three parts. First one is, what are your expectations for how status quo entrenched industry players will respond to DSI? Um, so it depends, right? Their shareholders might react negatively, but the people making the decisions and the people that actually are mission driven, they will react positively because they know they have a problem. The APC model charging $10,000 for a scientist to have the privilege to publish his work, they know it's not sustainable. That's, that's, that's a conversation we've been having. And there's that, uh, uh, there's that definite feeling that the system as it stands cannot continue. And they're desperately looking for different models. And if we can create a system that complements, right? It doesn't need to compete. It can complement the existing industry by adding value in terms of reproducibility. This is how we gain legitimacy in the scientific sphere, right? This is how we show our value, the value of DSI, that we're not just about buzzwords and Web3. No, we're actually about creating a better, more reproducible scientific record. And here's proof of that. Awesome, thank you. Uh, next question is, what does the attack surface look like for a DSI protocol? Okay, so the, the, the big problem is identity spoofing, right? So, uh, and this is also not just a problem that's specific to DSI, right? You also can also have identity spoofing on archive. You can also have identity spoofing, you know, on ORCID. Um, there is a problem with identity spoofing, right? And we need ways to essentially uh, um, 
to, to link, to create a gradient of trust around the, scientific, the scientists that post their work uh, to verify their identities and to essentially have some measure of uh, uh, confidence that they are who, they, who they, they say they are, right? And this, we're super excited working with uh, Shadi and his team with Holonym. You know, there's many, many interesting things in the space of identity uh, that are burgeoning up. Uh, and this has been just accelerating since the DSAR paper, right? Which has been a catalyst for all of that. And we're super excited to see, you know, the type of solutions that, that, that come up. But essentially the problem of identity spoofing is, uh, uh, is, a, is a very important problem. And then finally, uh, how do we engineer resilient protocols that survive long enough to uplift the publishing industry through transformational change? And then he also said, sorry for having such hard questions, but you're doing a great job answering them. I love those questions. Uh, yeah, open source, decentralized, community gateways, right? Should the, the, we are building a protocol that does not depend on the continued operation of these labs, right? And I think that's fundamental. Um, as a scientist, that's the only reason, I mean, that's, that's a prerequisite for me to use it. Right. I want essentially to be to to have uh, the ability to put my work on a peer to peer system, where where these multiple DSI gateways reinforce each other, creating network effect for each other's, and start you know writing on this uh, uh, on this uh, uh, DSI registry, and start accumulating and creating a graph of knowledge that is uh, reproducible, that has spare metadata, that has all these other properties in a way that is that nobody can shut down access to. Right? There's no paywalls that can be put in front of it. Right? The system is built in to be designed such that Elsevier cannot buy it out and, and shut it down. Right? It has to be slippery, right? just like BitTorrent, except it needs to, of course, be very legal to use. Right? So I think that's very important. We need to right, remain within the, the precise confines of the law. We have to do everything by the books there. And we need to essentially uh, empower communities with base layers that they can use and, and, and operate in an open source fashion. Awesome. Thank you. And, and Chris, if you're okay with it, it sounds like we have a couple more questions. If you want to hang around for another five minutes or so. Sure, sure. I'm more than happy. Cool. So I, I, yeah, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions uh, since you touched on uh, reproducibility. Uh, this is something I really care about. And I just like recently wrote a piece on research of, on, you know, how to potentially, uh, you know, make this better. Uh, a question I have is, do you think, is there a way to kind of like, you know, decentralize the work of verifying reproducibility for a study? Decentralizing that in a way that we can kind of like create a decentralized consensus on scientific claims. So we have different kind of like research groups trying to like replicate a study and see who fails, who does, who does not fail. Because we also have to take into account human error. That's something that, you know, might happen. So there's really two different things here. There's reproducibility and replicability, right? So for those that don't know, reproducibility, can I recreate uh, the study's result given the available artifacts? Whereas replicability is, you know, I use new artifacts, you know, new code, I collect new data, and can I come back to the results, right? So these are two different things. They have their own associated challenges, right, which are uh, very, very important. And this is a, 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 by the way, this is this is uh, the problem in science uh, from, from, from our point of view. It's the, the lack of reproducible and replicability. And, and if you talk to scientists out there, they'll say, yes, that's the problem. Um, the way we can do that, we think, is that we have to emulate structures that have been functioning. For example, the ACM SIGIN conferences have been verifying ACM badges. Uh, the American Economic Association has been verifying reproducibility of research. They have a culture and they have processes in place to do this. We have to learn from them and we have to then create a knowledge base that we can essentially uh, uh, couple with these, these uh, ARCs, these autonomous research kits, right? That can be deployed by these communities so that they can effectively conduct a, a replication evaluation, right? And that, that requires, of course, a lot of learning. Uh, there's a lot of community leadership that needs to be done. Uh, but the, the fundamental thing here is that it's now the scientific societies that recapture the value. Right? It doesn't go to the publisher. So all of a sudden, your research community can create fellowships right, for its PhD students. They don't need to live under the poverty line anymore. Could be, you know, just, just a little, you know, 500 die a month. That would go a long way in improving the situation of a student. And as a PI or as a senior scientist, I would feel a responsibility, you know, to, to, to help my guys out. And you can now do that. We could orchestrate, we can create community coordination structures that allow for that, 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 that specific goal of certifying reproducibility while 
you know, returning value to scientists, which can be reinjected in the, in the accounts of people that need it the most, the early career researchers. Yeah, thank you. That, that, was, that was really a great explanation, actually. Also, you know, getting into the, the difference that is really important between uh, reproducibility and replicability. So we actually have another one uh, from the audience. Uh, what are your thoughts about reproducibility and immutability with the fact that many real data sets and metadata, uh, specifically in social media and healthcare, are personal information and protected by right to be erased? Thank you. That's yeah, but, I mean, great question, right? So there's, there's different ways to address that. Um, one of the thing is we want to make clear, do not put restrained access data on the ESI right now, right? That is not something that is appropriate. The reason is there's all sorts of regulation that essentially gate the rights to especially human data, right? Which is very, very sensitive. And we have to be extremely mindful of the sensitivity of that type of data. Um, However, you can create a component which is called a restrained data access notice, right? And that component is essentially a metadata set which tells the reader where he can find the restrained access data, how he can access it, what are the conditions of access? And that is preserved immutable. Now that has a lot of value because this is something right now that is lacking. There's, there's very little clarity in accessing in the conditions of access to uh, restrained access data. And what does that mean? Now, if you create a system in science where every study is expected to be reproducible, do we just say, okay, we give these guys, you know, a free pass. They don't need to have reproducible results because their data is restrained access. We can't do it. No, right? That doesn't work. That's a, that's a, that's a monumental problem. And that's why it's important to know who who's, has the right to access it. So that's communities that do the scientific verification services they can actually have members that might have access to that data, right? That would do it within the trusted uh, bounds of their institutions. And so that's essential. Yeah, I, I really cannot agree more with, with what you just said. Um, okay, so it uh, seems like we got all of, the, all of the questions answered. So if there's uh, no more questions, I would, uh, yeah, wrap this one up. Uh, thank you again, Christopher, for, for joining Saigon, being here today. It was really a pleasure. Thank you for organizing. Great talks. Okay, so for our last lot, we have Cole. Uh, Cole D'Elia is the content creator behind Investigate, Explore, Discover, a YouTube channel dedicated to making science more accessible through video summaries. He's an active scientist and holds an MSc in immunology. So he's going to do a workshop uh, today. So I will just, you know, um, open the floor to Cole to his talk on expand your impact, utilizing video as a medium for science communication. The floor is yours, Paul. Well, fantastic, thank you, Ricardo. Let me uh, share this. So, hi everyone. Uh, today, really, I'm gonna, so like Ricardo mentioned, today I'm gonna be uh, focusing on expanding your scientific communication impact using video. So, how many people here have experienced what it feels like after months or even years of work that you put into a project that the reception of it is really a little lackluster? I know that on multiple occasions, I felt like all of my work just ended up really being a line on my CV. And I've been thinking to myself, well, who's gonna look at it and why should they care about the work that I've done? There has to be a way to utilize modern technology to make science something that isn't dry and dusty. And it's from this idea that I've found that using recorded video can increase the impact and reach of your work. Now, today we're gonna to be talking about a lot of different concepts, just like, all of the speakers uh, before me. So I'll be talking on a few familiar areas, but I'm gonna outline specifically what I'm gonna be talking about today. So when thinking about science communication, we first need to have a crystal clear, we first need to be crystal clear on what exactly science communication is and why it's important. This will then lead us to, to why video is really the superior form for knowledge dissemination and how making a video is not the end of your journey. For your video to be successful, it requires also a bit of marketing to get other people to notice, which is something that is not particularly native to me. Now, luckily, uh, there's also a way for you to get started that does not require you to build up that audience exposure from the very beginning. Following that, uh, love to take any questions or comments that you have about anything that I've talked about today. So grab your pen and paper, jot down any comments as they come up, and we'll talk about those later. Anyway, I want to introduce myself uh, so that way you can know a little bit about why I'm on the camera in the first place. Now, I'm a Canadian scientist living in Boston, currently working in biotech to create cells as therapy for cancer and diabetes. 
I graduated from the University of Alberta in 2021 with an MSc in immunology, where I also graduated with a BSc with an immunology specialization. So my training is very immunology and related topics focused. Uh, I'm also a published author with multiple publications, so I've been around that block a little bit as well in regards to disseminating information. Most of my free time is spent doing science communication by making videos through my YouTube channel, Investigate, Explore, Discover, though not everything I do revolves around science. I also like to read, explore the environment by going for walks and playing some video and card games now and then. Now, science is a very public field that relies on communication between multiple parties. Researchers are given money by funding agencies, which are in turn funded by the government to create new findings. Now, these new findings impact the public way of life in some respects, which impacts then how the government is elected and then in turn drives science informed policies and the culture of education. So there's a responsibility that science scientists have to make sure that their information is first and foremost accurate, correct, and reproducible, but also to let people know about the new findings that you've discovered and why it's important to society as a whole. This is somewhere that I've noticed there's a large pain point for people. Now, all of the world's knowledge will not help people unless it's disseminated and applied to as many people as possible. The people in the, and the people in this call have distinct knowledge specialties that many other people could benefit from, but other people need to hear about it. This is why I think it's a truly public duty of the educated, much like how voting is, to share their information with people who want to learn from them. So why should you be contributing to sharing information? Already, scientists have a huge role to play in communicating information, and you're likely already doing some science communication. Not only do you communicate the information you generate to your peers to get their informed view on your work, scientists also share findings with journals and the media once the information has been peer reviewed. Now, it's the people in those communication agencies whose job it is to disseminate this information to the public. However, there are also other parties that act as intermediaries between all of these groups. And as brutally evidenced by recent events, the communication agencies are really incapable of competing with other actors or are too biased in their own reporting yeah, to tell the public about new information as it comes out and combat the disinformation that the general person is subject subjected to. This is, in part why we're, this is in part why we are now facing the epidemic of science misinformation. Simply put, humans are biased creatures that love to listen to information that confirms their biases. And some of the easiest ways to consume information is through video. Now, a great example is people who believe the Earth is flat. No amount of reasonable information will convince them otherwise because they employ logical fallacies and mental gymnastics to maintain their belief in how they think the world functions. Now, not everyone in every field is perfect. There will always be bad actors and those who seek personal gain overall. But the large majority of people working to further scientific advancement are working in good faith and trying to accurately and truthfully report facts. And it is in the public interest for those who are informed on topics to speak out and advocate for information that is factual. This is why people do not, this is, so this way, people do not get confused by trying to figure out what is factual and what is opinion. And we can agree on a common, whoops, on a common set of information, allowing us to further build upon human knowledge. Now, a particularly devastating issue that we are currently seeing is people who discount climate change and people who mistrust health agencies related to public health. In a survey done of 225 people, almost 40% of them claim that there is some false allegation on public authority action. And up to a quarter of people believe false claims regarding community spread, general medical knowledge, and prominent actors. When I saw this happening in real time over the past two, two and a half years, this was incredibly disheartening and upsetting to see a general loss of trust in healthcare experts and scientists working at lightning speed. We've never seen this rapid advancement that we've seen before to understand and create solutions to the public health challenge of COVID-19. This emboldened the idea that, and for me, sorry, this emboldened the idea that science communication is the job of every scientist for the greater public good, because we all know more about our topics than most, and we can use that information to inform and help the communities around us. Now, if the altruistic message didn't quite convince you to get involved with science communication, there are also personal benefits to it. By practicing your science communication skills and disseminating accurate information to other people, overall, it increases your social currency or your access to it, which is an undervalued skill that can open many doors for you in your endeavors to come. 
It does this by increasing confidence in your subject and increasing views of your work. This in turn increases collaboration opportunities and the chance to work with multitudes of different people. These soft skills can, there can also be translated to sharpening your ideas and skills to get funding from public agencies alongside increasing your chances to get hired outside of academia if that's the route you choose, which I did. Now, typically through our scientific training and schooling, we're taught to communicate information in an inverted triangle. We're taught to take up the most time talking about the background, followed by supporting details, backing up our statements, and then the final results and conclusions once we've led people to that point. Now, this is only really effective for people that have a vested interest in the topic that you're talking about, or if you're particularly engaging. Now, to be teaching the up and coming generation of scientists with only this model of science communication is what I think borderline criminal and constitutes a major failure of the education system. Part of the issue with this is that people have short attention spans, of which I'm certainly guilty of. Communication classes and experts will tell you that people want the bottom line first, followed then by why they should care and then the supporting details. Basically the opposite of how we are taught to convey information. This ends up stifling and confounding people who try to get into the communication field who were solely trained in science, which is a bit short-sighted for the continual progress of knowledge. Now, inherently, there's a knowledge gap in the people presenting on a topic and the people listening to it. This is called the knowledge deficit. It is the job of the presenter to bridge that gap of knowledge by easing people into topics, not by intimidating them with mountains of information that they have no way of possibly remembering. This is done when there is engagement of the audience to allow them to understand a complex topic. So again, please shoot your questions. And also when seeking to engage and share information, there's actually a handy list that can help guide you as to how to communicate. This is because when communicating science, there are typically some boxes that you wanna check off to make sure that your point is getting heard. You want to highlight the trustworthiness of your information by being transparent, balanced, factual, and scientific. You also wanna focus on your presentation style by making it clear, coherent, spellbinding, and engaging for the audience with interaction. You also wanna connect what you're doing with society by responsibly showing purposeful and targeted information, which is impactful and relatable. All of these aspects are important to try and include so that your message can be clearly conveyed. And this is especially important to keep in mind when there's a knowledge deficit between the people talking. So what is the best way to actually perform this feat of knowledge sharing? If you've been paying attention to what I've been talking about so far and the title of my talk, I'm sure you have, and I'm sure you have because you're a clever group, I'm sure that you have an inkling of what medium is best, but we'll still go through all the others just to make sure they have their chance at that. Now, when communicating your science as an academic, there are usually only a few avenues that are supported by the institutions you get trained at. They involve creating posters, giving conference talks, and finally culminate in writing papers that get stored in library archives, or are in citation databases, but you don't see it after that, really. Uh, when doing these forms of science communication in academic situations, I found also that people are just boring. They kind of suck at the communicating their talk. They, they suck at communicating their topics. They have no visible enthusiasm for sharing the information and speak monotonously and lecture at you, expecting you to care about their niche topic of interest. And I see why, because there's not really any incentive for them to do better presentations or reach a broader audience. Luckily, outside of academia, there are other options that you can pursue to engage people in the information that you're learning about that is actually pretty darn cool. So people can do science outreach programs to teach kids and adults about interesting concepts and discoveries. There are multiple examples. One of the ones I'll pull is, uh, it's, or it's meeting up in pubs and talking about your science in the cities, in cities around the world. Can't remember the name right now, so that's on me. But uh, people also start writing their own science blogs or contribute to those that are already established. This involves creating digestible summaries to more quickly convey the information in writing. Now, if writing isn't your thing, as it's not really mine, then podcasting or interviews can also be used to this aim. I, however, find that I don't have time to sit down and focus my attention to reading about something in length, which makes blogs and normal research articles really not that appealing for me. I also found that I like to have some sort of visual to accompany the information that I'm hearing, which also makes podcasts not as ideal. I usually prefer to watch videos and I find that it's easier to digest content 
content with the stimulation of more than one of your senses. In fact, I'm not alone in this sentiment. To put this into context of just how much media is consumed through video, think about it. How many of you or people that you know put on the TV or YouTube videos in the background while doing chores or just lounging about, or even before they go to bed? How many TikToks do you watch in a day compared to news articles do you read? In fact, if you go on a plane, are you more likely to watch some of the movies or shows, or are you more likely to read something? So this is why a, well, what, this then begs the question, why is there not a stream of readily available science content to watch on specialized topics? This is why science communication through video is so important. Through video, you can elucidate complicated topics with visual aids to better bridge that knowledge deficit, and you can even put your own creativity and personality sprinkled throughout. And with platforms like YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok, anyone can start creating content. Now, video science communication is a huge market that already has proven interest in it. Think about Bill Nye, how, who many people, including myself, watched growing up. There's also the Planet Earth series that shows people the wonders of animals and the ecosystems that they live in. There are also many different, or there's also many different content types that you can create to attain this aim. You can start, like I said, an interview ser video series where you highlight prominent researchers to get their take on their own work and you can borrow their expertise to communicate information. You can also create comprehensive videos that elucidate a certain topic. Think about Kurtz gesagt. Uh, you can also do TikToks like Lab Shenanigans and Dr. Knock for easily digestible content in a minute or a few minutes. Uh, you can also tap, and if you are having trouble thinking, well, what should I present on? What should I create? You can tap into the millions of scientific articles that are published each year along with your own to transform into video content in a more focused approach because nobody has enough time to go through and read all of these all of these papers, like there's just too many. And admittedly, this is what I do. I take interesting research and present it to people in a digestible fashion. However, when making content, there really needs to be an end goal, a target audience who will want to watch what you're creating. Now, when writing a paper, you know that your audience will be other scientists with an interest in your field. When writing a grant, you know that your audience is the funding agency and you can craft your story according to who you're speaking to. For example, you're not going to tell your family about the intricacies of your research work or work you do when they don't work in that field. If you do, as I've done in the past, you're gonna be left with a bunch of blank faces and head scratches. Instead, I found that talking about broad concepts and the implications of your work alongside a few analogies really gets my point across. For example, when I talk about DNA, RNA, and protein, I exemplify them as DNA being uh, the computer database where the information is stored. The RNA are like blueprints that get printed out and the finished product, like a chair, for example, is the protein. So that way it's relatable to everybody that you're talking to. But just so long as you know who you're trying to talk to, you'll have an idea on how to present the information. A good tip, think about your topic like you don't know anything, which Definitely is difficult, but just requires some practice. Now on media platforms like Twitter, LinkedIn, Research Hub, and Reddit, there are multiple communities that people are connected to that have vested interests in certain topics. By tapping into these networks through search engine optimization of your content and using uh, hashtags, you can also tap into these networks and get your content viewed by your target audience. Now there are also, uh, multiple publications to back this up that positively correlate the number of citations with tweeting about new scientific discoveries just in general. Therefore, it is also beneficial for you to be using these resources to the best of your abilities because it definitely didn't come easy for me. When using social media, the type of content also correlates with the amount of impact that it receives. When assessing the type of content posted on social media platforms, it was found that video is the most valuable for achieving social goals. So in the context of science communication, this means that video is most effective at communicating the goal of teaching people other, teaching other people information. Hammering home why, if you're making content, you should be diverting at least some of your energy into making videos. That being said, making videos does require a bit more work to create than just writing a blog post about your article or your favorite new discovery. 
The good news is that it's also not particularly hard and you already have the tools to do so. You, I'm sure everybody here has made presentations, had to present findings in some way or another. So you already have a rudimentary uh, grasp on those skills and you can get started by with making videos with nothing but your phone camera. There's no need to worry about having a fancy setup to get started and I would argue that it's better to try it out with what you have instead of making a heavy investment in something like this where some of the really nice equipment can be thousands of dollars. I started out with just my phone and a white backdrop coupled with a PowerPoint presentation of a paper that I found particularly interesting. In fact, I had already presented it uh, to my department as part of my uh, part of my scientific training. Now, getting in front of the camera is one of the most engaging things for your audience as it allows them to connect with you. But if getting in front of the camera isn't as appealing for you, there are other formats you can use. You can use video animations. <clears throat> In fact, there does not need to be a personified figure on the screen at all. You can just do a voiceover of a PowerPoint presentation or just have a video of the research article where you go through and highlight things uh, and commenting on it with your face off screen, though I don't find those as engaging. Heck, you don't even have to use your own voice. You can do a text to voice type of video if you wanted to as well. All you have to do is make the visuals and write a script. Therefore, there's a format that would work for everyone interested in making this type of content. The best part is that there are also people that can help guide you in your video making journey. That's where I come in, really, because I've been making content with Investigate, Explore, Discover for over a year and a half now. As I mentioned earlier, I have a background in immunology, so that's the focus of my content. And I dip into related fields because I'm proficient at, I have a large knowledge base of them. However, likely you have whole other specialities that you're focused on and passionate about, which is perfect because Invextus, as I lovingly call it, and Investigate, Explore, Discover is a mouthful, uh, is a platform meant to make science accessible to non-expert audiences by providing video summaries of open access peer-reviewed journal articles. And I'm looking for people that are also passionate in making science more accessible. Uh, if you're considering doing this, I have ample experience creating videos and already have an established audience of over a thousand subscribers on YouTube and over a thousand subscribers on Twitter. I also have a well-documented presentation structure to help guide you through presenting scientific papers like your own that you might have published recently or in the past. And I'm also available to help you by answering any questions that you might have and by coaching you through how to best present, represent your information online to others. Alternatively, I'm also open to collaboration if you have information that you'd like more coverage of or if you'd like more coverage of your research. So these are some of the best ways to contact me at investigateexplorediscover@gmail.com or at Invextus on Twitter. So please message me. I'd love to hear from you. And really just remember, no one is perfect the first time they try things. It's all a learning experience, and if you're willing to put in the time, it can yield great benefits to you and the world at large. So throughout this whole talk, we've talked about what science communication is, why it's important for both you and the world. We also talked about video science communication and how it's a more effective form of content creation for getting messages across. We also talked a little bit about utilizing social media and how that can increase your reach. And finally, an easy way for you to get started is by working with me or setting out on your own journey. I'd love to see that too. The more people working on this, the better it will be for everyone. Now, I wanna hear from you in the audience. Please let me know if you have any questions or comments that you have around anything that I've told you about today. Thank you, Cole. That, that was a really, really a great talk. And uh, I might kick this off actually. Uh, I wanted to you know, ask you a quick question. Uh, what do you think here could be the role of institutions? Do you feel like institutions should play a role in trying to like help their, you know, a PhD students or a postdocs trying to communicate their science better or it should be something else should come just like, you know, from scientists them, themselves? Ideally, I think that institutions should be doing a much better job at training their wards, really. All of the people going through their undergrad, all of the people going through their graduate studies, doing science alone, is not 
it's not enough anymore. You need some sort of education on how to promote yourself because everything really ends up being marketing. And with people that are just focused on doing lab work, they, I've seen many times where they miss out on that. And so their careers are not as fruitful. So I think that it is, it should be a responsibility of the institutions. Will they do it? Ugh, hard to say. So it kind of ends up relying on the scientists themselves to really be self-starters. Okay, so we, we actually have another question from, uh, from the audience, from Joanna, that asks, do you think Web3 can customize scientific videos and audiences, for example, through scientific platforms? So here, this kind of links also to my second question is, do you think, you know, we're, we're going digital. We're seeing more and more, just like the amount of time we're spending on the screen. So do you think here, Web3 tools can play, you know, a role in here in trying to like, I don't know, uh, kind of like align the incentives and ever, you know, having this specific platforms kind of like uh, getting out of, uh, you know, like um, uh, burn and kind of like promoting this uh, effort into making scientific videos. Absolutely. I think that, uh by use, utilizing Web3 tools and really the blockchain by creating uh, content that will be there forever and is attributable to you alongside uh, getting some sort of monetary compensation for it. Because one issue that I saw with academia, one of the reasons why I left is because all you really accrue are science points and science points don't do anything for you in any real sense. And they're difficult to accrue. So having some sort of incentive through uh, Web3 organizations and uh, websites like Research Hub, where you can get some sort of uh, monetization from doing all of the, this work, I think would accelerate this in leaps and bounds. Because right now it's pretty thankless. I do it all on a volunteer basis and it takes up a lot of time. Do you think it could exist something like, I don't know, a service, like, you know, you don't have, you know, enough time, but there might be someone there that could help you out and kind of like create content for you? Uh, I, I would absolutely love to pay people to work with me. And I realistically can't expect people to do this all for free. Like having access to that capital to also incentivize other people is something that I would like to look or would like to work towards in the future. Okay, awesome, awesome. Yeah, I would not really mind having more uh, science influencers when compared to the influencers we have now. So it's uh, something really like, that, you know, looking forward, uh, looking forward to. Okay, so uh, I think, uh, so thank you, Cole, uh, once again, for, for coming up for uh, SciCon. We are uh, closing, we're closing this, uh, you know, this today's, today's souls with, with Cole. So we're wrapping up the event. Uh, Patrick, you're there as well i think we can uh, wrap this one up yeah so thank you cole that, that was awesome I, I guess i have one question before we move on first um mm -hmm. if it's okay with you um yeah so i, I think like one thing that's like missing in the equation for scientists is how uh, scientific communication can actually uh help to increase them to get more science points to a certain degree have you ever come across any studies uh, that show that creating videos about your paper helps to increase uh, citations just to help connect the dots for people who are still really worried about like this traditional, you know, uh, point system in academic science? I have not seen any uh, research on video communication of people's work. I think that's partially because there's not a lot of people doing it. I know that some uh, research journals will require that you create a graphical abstract, which is fantastic. There are some people that, or there are some uh, publishing houses that also ask for like one to two minute uh, or summaries of what you've presented in your paper, which I think is a lot more valuable because reading a paper takes a lot of time. Uh, but ultimately, I think it would, but I haven't seen any studies on that. But again, I think that's because it's not widely adopted. Yeah, it totally makes sense. I'm sure it's just a matter of time. I feel like every like ML paper I see coming out of like Google and Facebook, they always have a YouTube video to help even just with like SEO and making people like uh, discover the paper a little bit easier. So 
And this is awesome. What, cool. what do we think, Patrick? Uh, this like we're also playing a, a role here with our you know Presenio Research Competition. This kind of like got totally. into like the similar direction of trying to you know explain your research in simple terms that could be understood to make science more digestible for people. So I think again with individual you know kind of like efforts we can all try to try to change this for for the better. So yeah, sorry for interrupting, Patrick. No, it's like a, a perfect transition. So uh, where we are now is we'd like to um, present the winners of the Present Your Research competition. And so this is the hub for the Present Your Research competition. Just a reminder, it was a two to three minute video about um, your own science. So in third place, we have Oliver Brown, uh, who shared a video. Um, this is not the same one that I had before. Or no, I guess it's uh, Alexander Morse is third place. Uh, who had a presentation on bioinformatic analysis of mechanisms of indirect, is that cadmium uh, impact on uh, MAPK signaling through DUSPS? Um, I'm going to have to watch this video to fully understand that. But uh, thank you, Alex, uh, for the third place winner of the Present Your Research competition. Uh, second place is our own uh, Jeff Corey, uh, the operations lead of Research Hub who uh, shared a video on his research that has to do with uh, Eprin B and how it's upregulated in HIV encephalitis brains and inversely correlates with the inhibitory neuronal markers. Um, finally, uh, first place for the Present Your Research competition is the conference uh, lead organizer, Ricardo. So congrats, Ricardo, way to go. Uh, he recorded a video about uh, wearable uh, intraoral sensors and biosensors for non-invasive salivary diagnostics. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more about how you can have non-invasive uh, biomarker detection, uh, check out uh, Ricardo's video in the uh, Present Your Research Competition Hub. And then moving over to the main competition, um, this is the ELN competition, the blogs that we have. Um, so I think I'm just going to check my notes really quick to make sure I get this right. Um, we have Timothy uh, in third place who uh, has evaluation of DSI projects. This is a really nice blog talking about like how different uh, like projects in the DSI space can be valued, um, trying to like, I think, bridge the gap between like traditional investments uh, and kind of more socially uh, focused uh, DSI projects. So uh, congrats, Timothy, for number three. Um, number two, uh, we have Alexander again. Uh, who wrote about the role of metaphors and mnemonics in understanding DSI and ensuring more effective communication of information about it. So again, this is talking about how um, scientists can uh, make their work more relatable to the average audience member. And then um, the double champion uh, for the first year inaugural um, ELN competition is uh, Ricardo, uh, who wrote a really nice blog talking about revamping the scientific paper. Uh, the paper background, key references, and reproducibility score. Yeah, so thank you for everybody who uh, submitted to both the Present Your Research and ELN competition. Um, we had some really good content uh, that was shared, and we'll probably be highlighting it over the next couple of weeks through the Research Hub community. But um, yeah, thanks everybody for all the effort. Thank you to all the speakers, all the audience members. And then Ricardo, congrats, and thanks for all the effort that you put into organizing this whole thing. I think it's been like a huge success for our first event. So very grateful. This is very cool to be a part of. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. You know, again, this has been just a like a really big, big pleasure for me to to be able to, you know, be allowed to to organize this this first event. Um, so uh, yeah, again, really exciting. We've been putting this together for the past couple of months. It definitely took some effort, but mm -hmm. I feel like you know the, the 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 result, the outcome that we're we're getting out of this is really paying off uh, today. You know, when I'm when I'm seeing all of these amazing speakers are coming up. So um, I would probably leave uh, uh, Jeff maybe going a little bit over uh, what we also have as our uh, presence because we also have some NFTs and pop-ups, uh, pop designs that we made for, uh, for the winners of the competitions and all of the participants actually. Yeah, absolutely. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna move it over here actually. Yeah, so, um, oh wait, Let's put it there again. Um, yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, we are going to have um, a few awards for um, the winners. Um, so again, uh, we actually did public peer reviews, um, open peer reviews on a lot of the ELN submissions that occurred. Um, but ultimately, the decision boiled down to kind of like an unbiased, like um, 
group of like, especially actually those the meta science um, academics that presented day one of the plenary talks um, kind of went through and kind of ranked. Um, and so we have um, the first place prize and second and third place prize for the electronic lab notebook competitions uh, right here. Um, and then the uh, NFTs for the present your research for second and third place prizes over here that were just minted earlier today. So we'll go ahead and distribute these out to um, the winners of each of those competitions. Um, and we want to give also a big uh, thank you to Ted, um, who uh, works behind the scenes with us as a graphic designer uh, with like the Research Hub community. Um, and he's done like a really wonderful job with all the graphics that you've seen on the social medias as well as um, these NFTs. And then also want to give a shout out to him for the design of this uh, pull app. So this is going to be distributed out to um, the attendees of the uh, of the conference. Um, and so this is kind of like a badge, uh, so to say, of your attendance of the first inaugural event for uh, Research Hub PsyCon 2022. So just stay tuned for those uh, if you get something in your email. And then we'll, we'll communicate directly with the winners for the NFTs and the distribution for everything for that as well. Uh, and that's it from my end. Okay, thank you, Jeff, for, for going over uh, a lot of the designs uh, for the NFTs and pop-ups. So in this uh, next you know, couple minutes, actually final couple of minutes, I just wanted to, to wrap it up uh, and say, you know, this has been an amazing weekend, really, with a lot of amazing speakers. Uh, we'll be, um, first of all, uh, promoting the, the, the content that, uh, you know, the people that won the competitions, their content will be out, we'll be promoting that. Uh, but we will not be, uh, let's say, stopping here. There will be some um, some more things coming out of this cycle. So we'll go over, you know, what went uh, well, what did not well uh, so good. So you'll probably re uh, receive a survey in the next couple couple days uh, if you want to leave a feedback on, you know, what you liked, what you did not uh, like about Cycon. And again, be uh, completely uh, honest. Uh, this is our first event. So we, we really want, uh, we're really seeking for some honest uh, feedback on how we could uh, get better for, for the next one. And stay tuned, as Jeff said, because the next one is, uh, you know, is coming up after this one. And we're hungry for, uh, for more. So we'll be announcing if we have uh, some more events, but we're planning, definitely planning to, to do more um, in the future. Because first of all, it's been a whole lot of fun at least for me. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just amazing to see the DSI community uh, coming together around an event. I think it really, it really shows how we deeply believe in, in all of this. Um, so uh, one way you could uh, stay, you know, uh, in the loop for everything that we do at Research Hub is you can, uh, first of all, sign in on the, on the platform. It only takes a click. We have a really a uh, quick and easy um, uh, signing procedure with uh, one click Google, uh, Google one click, and uh, yeah, uh, join our Discord. Uh, follow us on Twitter. We'll be uh, posting again uh, regarding Cycon. We'll be we'll put out some of the registrations of the talks that we that we had in this in this weekend. And uh, again, feel free to reach out uh, through our channels uh, if you have any questions or you just wanna you know share some some feedback. I don't know anything. Anything else, Patrick? You want to add on top of this? Otherwise, no. no, not at all. That sounds perfect. Thank you, Ricardo, and thanks everybody for attending. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Have a nice day.